Okay, it is seven o'clock, maybe a little bit early. Um, but looks like we have everybody here. And so welcome to the meeting tonight. Uh, we will begin with an invocation uh, given to us by Shana Larson. She is the chair of the Arts Council, after which uh, Kurt Osler will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Just if the button isn't pushed, if it's not green, go ahead and push the button at the bottom. Of the it's race. green. Okay, you're good. <laughs> our Father in heaven, as we come before thee this night at the beginning of our city council meeting, we are so grateful for the opportunity we have to serve in the community, in the most beautiful community in Utah. We're grateful for all the many blessings that come to us from living here, and we ask that thy spirit would be here in this meeting, that we may be able to make good decisions, that we will be able to communicate with each other in a mindful and good manner. We're grateful for all the things that we have, Heavenly Father, and we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Everyone, please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're close to a full house tonight. That's always good to see. Um, now's the time for public appearances. So if you have an item to talk about that is not on the agenda, uh, feel free to come up and uh, give us three minutes of whatever you want to do. I see a couple of members from 1889 here visiting from the previous century and a half ago. Uh, do, you, do you have anything to share with us? Introduce yourself and your name, please. Thank you for having us. It's a long distance to travel. Uh, my name is Ernest Worthing, and this is the lovely Gwendolyn Fairfax. Uh, we are part of the performance of the importance of being earnest, which is taking place at the Highland Community Center on February 28th, March 1st, March 2nd, and March 4th. Uh, yes, we are very grateful for the opportunity we've had to work with the Highland City Arts Council. It has been a purely delightful. And if you have not had the opportunity to come and visit for such a performance, we would highly encourage you to do so. It is one of the most high societal tasks you can complete on your evening. And we are so very grateful for the opportunity to use the community center. It has been very lovely in accommodating us. And where can we get tickets if we want them? If you go to highlandcityarts.org, that is correct. And you can purchase tickets, tickets there. there. So that is starting next week on Thursday. So please come out. It'd be wonderful to see you. Thank you. All right, cheerio. And travel safe. Uh -oh. so we normally don't allow clapping, but in this case, it's very appropriate. So that's all right. Any, anyone else on an, uh, to speak to an issue that's not on the agenda? Um, state your name when you get up here. That would be appreciated. Hi, good evening. My name is Jason Alliger. I'm actually from Provo. And um, my wife and I have fallen in love with a home in Highland. And we'd love to move our young family here. Uh, the home itself, um, I'll pass out a map. I, it looks like this is going to be a first for me. We're going to try to influence a <laughs> move. Um, it's hard to drop this one, I guess. Sure. Yeah. So the home is on uh, 10931 North, 5750 West. And you can see on the map there. And the home comes with a vacant lot next to it. Uh, so it comes with a half an acre um, vacant lot that's like separately fenced and everything. And um, I would love to purchase the home and subdivide the lot selling it to um, another young family. I have a friend who's interested in purchasing it. And um, so this is a corner lot. And after talking with Tara in city planning, uh, there's basically two issues. Uh, the first is that it's eight feet um, too short for the zoning laws. And the second one is that this development doesn't allow for another home. So it's development code R140. Um, so basically, 
I really want to move to Highland. I would love to move into this home and love that have the possibility to subdivide the lot. And so I'm just here to get, um, you know, the, the city council's direction on what I should do. So you would subsidize, subdivide that lot so it would be two quarter acre lots? Be two half acre lots. Two half acre lots. Yeah. And if you look at the map, there's a lot of other homes that are also half acre lots there too. Just as a, a point of information, if it's if an item is not on the agenda, the council can't make a decision tonight, but we can take input and then consider it on a future agenda. So council members, if you have any questions beyond what he's providing? Have you uh, talked to staff about whether it meets the code requirements? Um, yeah, when I talked with staff, they, they said, you know, this is an undeveloped vacant lot, um, but there wouldn't have to be any improvements made on it. No, I'm talking about the zoning. So as, if it's an R140, then there's a certain zone and there's a certain amount of um, one acre lots and half acre lots and those kinds of things. Has it met that criteria? Um, that's a great question. I mean, basically, when I talked with them, they said it's Tara. I think can. Yeah, there's Tara. <laughs> yeah. So the subdivisions already met their density allotment. Um, so that's the first obstacle, and then it also doesn't have enough frontage. So it's short. I believe eight, eight, eight to feet. ten feet. So for frontage. Yeah. So with both of those things, uh, it would be very difficult for me to even consider it. Uh, it's already meeting the. The requirements your subdivision we'd have to make an exception to your subdivision which means that anybody else in the whole city that wanted to make an exception we would be doing that for everybody else in the city as well sure. unless there was something unique about your particular lot there was absolutely not, no other home in the whole city that would match that same requirement or anybody else that was exactly the same we would want to do the same thing then i wouldn't be in favor of making that change just for you because we can't treat you different than we could anybody else here in the audience. Sure, yeah. So every homeowner would, if they met similar criteria, they would have that same right. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, thank right. you. Thank you so much. Anyone else with commentary on something that's not on the agenda item? All right, well, next up is a USDC property development update by Spencer Moffat from Boyer Company. Nathan, did you have any intro for that? Okay, Nathan is, or not, Spencer, sorry. Go ahead, come on up. Um, he's the project manager for the development of the land south of Lone Peak High School. Thank you. I'm uh, Spencer with the Boyer Company. Um, looks like you have a full house here, so we'll go quickly. The, uh, we wanted to come and just uh, catch you up on, on the public open house that you most of you attended a couple weeks back. Uh, I think the intent is to go through the feedback we received and what we've done to address some of that feedback. Um, we want to make sure as we move through this process that we're keeping the council in the loop and um, that we're, we're moving the right direction with the project. So uh, that being said, we'll just go quickly, um, if I can figure out this clicker. Um, I'm sorry, Mayor and Council, we forgot to print. I'm doing that right now. So in the meantime, if you can crane a little bit, I apologize. Uh-oh. Are, are we going to ever get this TV fixed so we can see? We finally have a solution and have, are working on getting it scheduled, but it won't be till mid-March because this room gets used so much. So, so I may... I, one more meeting. Okay. Uh, what I'm handing out is the updated concept plan, um, and really most of what we're going to talk about will go off of that. Um, I can't seem to be able to click through this, so. Um, so the. The first slide that I had kind of summarized uh, the, the feedback we got uh, from the residents, and, and this is not all of the feedback by any stretch of the imagination, but it seemed to be the most uh, salient issues that were brought up. Uh, traffic was probably first among those, specifically North County Boulevard, and how uh, traffic on North County would be affected by the development 
Uh, also, there were some very good points made about the high school and just traffic at peak hours for the high school. Um, we talked about the connector road west of the project that's up on top of Highland Glen Park. Um, and then there were some concerns about the flex space, uh, particularly the multifamily, uh, and then the density and, and uses within that flex space, and then uh, both the uh, future church sites and uh, school sites within the project. So just quickly, uh, we'll go through what we did, and uh, you know, at any point if you have questions, I, I don't know if it's uh, par for the course, but feel free to interject or, or um, you know, ask questions or follow-up questions. Uh, with regard to traffic, I think that's the biggest uh, there was some great feedback from the residents. We really appreciated the opportunity to speak to them. They obviously drive the area, know the area, and provided some things that we didn't know. Uh, we eliminated some of the access points um, from uh, Cedar Hills Boulevard into the project, and then we created a um, arterial road that ties into the high school par parking lot back to Canal. And the point of this was to kind of direct the, the traffic down one road from the high school rather than ha have it disseminate through the whole project. We also took all of the driveways off of that road going through the project so that we won't have conflicts between people backing out in high school traffic, um, which a lot of the residents talked about and were concerned about. Um, uh, additionally, we added a landscape buffer between the high school and, and the project on Cedar Hills Boulevard. Um, the intent of this was to just provide some separation between homes and the high school. Um, the, several of the residents brought up the fact that, you know, we'll have uh, students parking close to homes and, and down streets. So uh, rather than um, about the homes right up to that, the, that parking, we provided a buffer there. Um, and then um, one of the, the mayor that was really helpful gave us this traffic study. I think that was a, a big help. I think that's something that we can provide information to the residents and how impactful that that connector road is going to be. So that was um, a, a big point, and I think something that will help um, with the project. Uh, the we also I think the next slide um, there was oh and are then these, one, are the homes that are um, against the school road. Are those going to be backyards and there's going to be a fence there? Correct. So you're not going to have the homes opening into no, that? No, and we actually had that. Our original plan had that, and a, a lot of the residents said, hey, that's a bad idea just with the traffic and with games and with students. Don't, don't do that. Um, and so we took that advice. And there's a wall, and more, I guess we created a buffer there between the high school and the project. We also eliminated the connection, speaking of traffic, um, along the west side of the project over to Canal Street along Knight Boulevard. I think we heard from several people that that was less than desirable because that would become a speedway through the project. So um, you said you, you eliminated the most western road in the plan, correct? We, we didn't eliminate the road, we eliminated the connection. So not, it still ties into the, the upper parking lot, but we don't take it all the way through to Canal Street or Canal Boulevard, I guess is what we're calling it. Um, so, so the plan is to have the high school kids go through the middle of this subdivision. Is that going to be a two lane? Are you anticipating that? Uh, we haven't gotten there. We did widen it. Um, and we did, uh, like I said, take the driveways off of that. Um, the concern was that if you had driveways fronting onto that road, that is a potential hazard with, you know, children and car coming out on bikes. And, and so everything orients um, into the pods rather than onto that street. Um, and so that was... You know, there's another secondary access down below. If you look just west of that road, there's a second access that comes through. But the intent was to keep the traffic on there over to Canal and not send it through the entire project. So I think it breaks up the traffic nicely. Um, with re regard to the multifamily, um, we heard from a lot of folks about the housing types. Um, one of the comments that we heard several times was, hey, could you look at alternative housing uh, in the flex space rather than apartments. And so we're, we're in the process of doing that and that's something that we're evaluating, potentially not doing apartments in there rather and, and instead doing some additional townhomes. Have you looked at what's called mansion homes where they have we, like six units but it looks mm -hmm. like a home on, on the front but on the back is where all their things but they're individual yeah. units. Is that what you're kind of considering? Um, I don't know as if we have a definitive home type that we're considering, but the, the density would be an order of magnitude lower than what multifamily would be. Uh, multifamily, you know, we're talking in a range of 20 to 25. Um, under, you know, townhome scenario, you're probably talking 9 to 13, so you're cutting the density in half. And the latest iteration of the plan that we have shows a, a drastic reduction in overall units. Um, you know, we're here to, to 
um, you know, do, do the right thing for the community. And that was one piece of feedback that we heard. So we're evaluating whether that works economically or not, but it's something that, you know, I, I think there's the possibility of. Um, so, and then also with the, the commercial, we have it orienting onto that canal um, and, and the neighborhood, it's shown as neighborhood commercial there that fronts onto that road. Would you mind just sharing with the council what you're considering commercial? Like, is it office, restaurant? Is it, yeah. What, what type of retail? Or? Yeah, so I, I think it would be professional office, metal, medical office, um, dining, um, small retail pads. I think that's anything within that family. Um, you know, what it is not is a regional retail with big box. Um, you know, that's, that's, I think our assessment has been that it could support some, some neighborhood commercial and do pretty well at that. Um, so you know, with that, any other questions? I just have a comment to make. Um, I was working some with the church in the stake, because this will be in my stake, and uh, I was told Sunday, I don't know what your latest is, but the church's new philosophy is that they will put four wards in every building before they build another building. And apparently they own another lot somewhere in Highland that's all paid for, that nothing's been built. So the word I got from the facilities manager and different things is they have no intention of building a church in here. Uh, I have not heard that. The only thing no. I've heard is that they want to sit down and discuss it. I know there's different groups that have different opinions. Um, right. And candidly, one of the reasons we do development the way we do is we create pods that if and when the demand changes, we have the ability to accommodate them um, right. should they, they want it. So, I just thought I'd give you an update. You may want to talk more about that. That's now. very helpful. I had not heard that. Um, yeah, I just heard it Sunday, two well, days ago. So That's great information. I appreciate you, you sharing that. And we'll follow up on that and, and, and share with what we hear with you as well. Uh, with regard to the school, I think there was the same uh, position from the school district that they're, you know, the elementary population is diminishing in the area and they feel that they're in a position to, to meet the demands of the uh, number of students that will come in. So any of those can change down the road and we keep sure. open communication with those groups, but we certainly want to make sure that, you know, we're doing what's right for the community. One of the things I hear often is we wish we had some sit down dining. Uh, and so I'm not sure what, what the plan is or what would attract um, dining folks to to uh, to locate in Highland in this in this area, but it's something that is needed. We don't really Absolutely. have it in Highland, and we don't, really don't have it in Cedar Hills either, which is right next door. Uh, well, we don't have it in Alpine. We have McDonald's, of course, the street there. <laughs> so we're going to sit down dining at its fine. We're going to have all the audience come in and give you suggestions yeah. like Cheesecake Factory and yeah, all these others. Let's make a list. Let's, yeah, yeah, exactly. And Eaters. they'll prioritize it for you as well. <laughs> right. Do we want to take a vote on, on dining? Uh, <laughs> I, I like Black Angus. So. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, no, and those are great suggestions. And I think, um, you know, as we, we go through, we'll work vigilantly to find the right uses for the property. And certainly a, a food component would be beneficial and that's one of the things that we bring to the table is those relationships um, you know so, Spen Spencer yeah. early on you had some senior housing in your plan and I don't see a senior housing you know. so we actually do have the the largest pod in there um, it and I will s it's on the right there if you okay so so that's about 13 acres of senior housing. Well, that have like clubhouse. I mean, that just, would, that, what we're hearing from our seniors, they want to have an area. Yeah. They'd like to have a clubhouse, you know, fill me with a pool. Is that what you're kind of considering? That, that would be the intent. Now, you know, to be clear, just because we show it on a map doesn't mean that's exactly how it's going to be. But we think there's we've confirmed what you have all told us, that there's a strong demand for that. And they would want their own amenities. Um, and so the other thing that we've heard is you you've got to right size it, you can't do it too small or there's not enough economies of scale. So, you know, we're hearing 10 to 15 acres is, is kind of the sweet spot. So we've, you know, tentatively held that piece and that's not the exact layout of the buildings, but it's a placeholder, if you will, for that type of use. And, and we're definitely hearing that there's a strong demand for that, for sure. So question for you, Spencer, the, the green that's not labeled community park, I'm assuming that's HOA main, maintained green. Yeah, that would be just open space. Yeah, that would be trails. Um, 
I think we talked about at the open house having, you know, when you go higher density or smaller lots, you need open space, and that's exactly what that would be, and that most of those would be HOA maintained, yes. So. The community parks we'd maintain, is that? Yeah, that would be a, a city park and kind of the central gathering space for the whole community. Okay. So, yeah, with, we just, like I said, we'll be brief, and, and we wanted to keep you apprised. Your residents have been fantastic. We really appreciate their, appreciate their engagement. Um, I think, you know, in the near future, we'll reach out to them again and, and present these changes. But uh, certainly, if there's any concerns or, or issues with the direction we're going, we'd, we'd love to hear about those and, and, and correct those sooner rather than later. Appreciate all your work on this. Thank you. Spencer. Yeah. yeah, you guys have been, have been very helpful. We really appreciate it. Okay, next item is uh, item three, consent agenda items, or just one, the approval of the meeting minutes. I did notice that there were some changes requested and made. Uh, if, so here's your chance to request changes or to approve the minutes as the, they've been amended. I would move that we uh, approve the uh, consent agenda, the minutes specifically as amended. I'll second it. Second, uh, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Are we ready to vote? Okay, we do electronic voting for those of you that haven't been here before, and it mostly works. We're getting better. And so you'll see it before I do when it's all done. I'm gonna vote uh, verbally. Uh, I'm still getting my machine up. Okay, so. What is your vote, Ed? Uh, yes. That passes five to zero. Thank you. Uh, next item is public hearing, designation of open space property for disposal and removal of neighborhood option trails in the Canterbury North subdivision. Uh, staff will give us a report. Uh, during the report, uh, council may ask some questions, but once the report is over, then we'll open the meeting up for public input, right? Okay, thank you, Mayor and Councilman. So the proposal is to purchase a portion of the trail in Canterbury North. Um, you will see on the map here, a portion of the Northern Trail was already vacated. The green portion on the map will be remaining the same, I mean, remaining with the city, so they are not proposing that portion. So it is the lower red portion that leads into the park. They, are, they originally proposed a price decrease, which you saw in your packet, to the $1.44. Um, they recently came back today and decided to actually do the 25% of Utah County's um, assessed value, which would be at $3.21 per square foot. Um, they are not requesting any city financing. Is that it? Oh, no, okay. excuse me. <laughs> so we did recently find out um, last Thursday that there are some constraints with this property. There is a main PI line connection at the park down in the southern section that connects to the main sprinkler line that runs um, all through that trail. So all the pink or red, depending on what you see on the screen. Um, so we would have to move that connection point to that middle section on Canterbury Place. Um, and that we estimated that that could cost up to $15,000 potentially because we have to connect into the main PI line. Um, we have to do a new sprinkler box, new sprinkler clock, power. We have to do a power supply, which means cutting into the asphalt as well, so asphalt replacement. And so we estimate that could potentially cost up to $15,000. And that will help water the remaining portion of the trail that has vegetation and trees currently growing in it. The petition had 61% of property owners within the subdivision, which exceeds the 60% requirement. Um, we had 87% of adjacent property owners, which exceeds the 70% minimum requirement. For public notices, we did notify all the property owners within the subdivision on February 4th, and then we published in the Daily Herald as well on February 3rd. Um, they did post the sign on February 8th on the city trail. We have currently received five emails so far that are opposed to this petition. 
None of them were the people that signed the petition, either adjacent property owners or within the subdivision. For council options, you can approve as proposed, approved with conditions such as purchase price, removing the sprinkler line, removing the asphalt, um, and et cetera. You can continue the request for specific information such as for the purchase price, costs associated with reconnecting the sprinkler line, um, et cetera. That's it. We have the petitioners here as well, so if you have any questions that we are unable to answer, they might be able to address as well. <clears throat> Tara, just a quick question. In regard to the sprinkler line, what, what is the proposed change that you're um, making? Are you going to route it around? So we would have to connect um, into the main sprinkler line on that road, which is... On, on which road? I'm oh, I can't see on the map. Um, the right north, there in the middle. It, it's Canterbury Place. So instead of connecting to the park, we would have to put a new connection into Canterbury Place, actually cut the asphalt, tie into the PI line. So okay. we'd have a completely new uh, lateral line for the remaining parcels. So you just cap it at the park? Correct. and reestablish it on Canterbury Place. Right. We would have to remove the sprinkler line on the trail as well. That's currently in there. So Todd, is there pressure coming backwards back down into Canterbury Place or is there still gonna be a line, there's not gonna be a line existing. There won't, we won't have to have an easement is what you're saying, correct? Right. Okay. We would completely eliminate the line and tie it into Canterbury Place. Tara, you just mentioned you'd remove the line. Is there any reason why you'd need to remove the line that's been abandoned? Um, so I mean, that just seems like a cost that you wouldn't need to incur. Yeah. I mean, if the property owners wanted to cut it out, they could, but it's just a PVC pipe. Right. So if it's it's a shallow line, we're talking about a sprinkler line through there. So yeah. it, it could be removed or abandoned in place. Yeah. It would just seem more economical to abandon in place. But. All right, um, we're ready for public hearing. I get to use my gavel. Public hearing is open. Um, you're welcome to come up and state your views on this one way or the other. And I would ask uh, whatever the view is that we refrain from booing or hissing or clapping. That It, it would be, uh, this is the mayor's um, public hearing and ours as well, but it would be helpful to me if we could not repeat things over and over again, the same comments, and also it would be helpful if you could bullet point the pros and the cons from your perspective so that I can get a feel for, um, you know, why you're for it or why you're against it. Yes, so if you, if you want to come up and say ditto to previous, that'll work. <laughs> that works. <laughs> All right, any, any commentary? So um, I'm Scott Hansen. Our, uh, we're the, the one property that didn't, we're not on the petition and apparently not on the application as well. Um, so my wife and I, um, we've, like our neighbors, we'd love to have a little bit of, uh, a little bit more privacy and a little bit, um, you know, more property like the rest of us, the eight, eight families uh, that, that are there. But we do have some some concerns and a lot of questions. And I think that's my biggest thing is the, the, the questions that come from this. Um, so just as a first point, I just want to point out that we weren't really ever given an opportunity uh, to get on the application. There was a short discussion that we had in April or something like that with um, uh, Ryan Barker, and I said that I had some questions and wasn't ready to sign the petition. Um, so if this ends up passing, I just request that we be given a chance, like our neighbors, to get on the application so we have the chance to buy the property that's adjacent to our, our home. Uh, because right now we're, we're not on that. So um, second, we, we, we didn't sign the petition for two main reasons, uh, um, but one is that we value open space. I think a lot of people in the neighborhood move in because they like the parks and the trails and the open space and they find them very, very valuable. So you've, you've heard this before, I'm sure, but 
But uh, removing that after everyone knew what they were getting into, bought their properties, seems like it's changing the rules. Um, and so we don't like that. You know, obviously um, there's the, uh, you know, discussions, the, the discussion about maintenance, right? That always comes up. People are disappointed about how the trails are maintained. But this trail isn't any different than any of the other trails, I don't think, in that, that regard. Um, so um, the second main issue with us is, is just the idea of um, the, the questions. So we have lots of questions about the logistics, the costs, the implications, and, and so forth. Um, what are the timelines? you know, um, all of those things. And I, I, I struggle to sign a petition about making something happen when I don't understand, you know, the details on that, because I think they matter. And, um, and the last part of, you know, one of the main questions that I have is, if you look at the map, we're removing half of a trail. And I don't understand why just half of a trail. Why would we just do a half? It seems like there's costs and other things that would go, if, if our half of the neighborhood decides we want more privacy and more land in, 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 um, for our yards, seems like the other half would want that as well. So, um, yeah, and, and, and the last thing is, I, I read through the, the petition um, and, and it's still unclear to me the specific, the specific problems that this is trying to solve. And if we know the specific problems, then it might be easier for us to understand if this solves the problem. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I have a question for Tara or Kim or Nathan. Um, if, if this gets approved and they purchase, are there obligations incumbent upon them to remove the trail within a period of time or readjust the fences or put sprinklers in? It's just because I, I didn't see any, and my assumption is it's their property. And, they right. So when, once, uh, assuming it is purchased, once it's closed, then it becomes their re responsibility to do timing according to them. So and each individual landowner is responsible for their yes. part of the property. And then I have a question, too. The petitioners agree to the $3.21? Yes, they said so today that they agree to that price. Nathan, just with uh, Mr. Hansen coming up, he asked if he was not part of the petition, if this does pass, can he then be part of the purchase of the property? I was, what's the answer to that? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, it, the answer is yes. <laughs> and if I assume correctly, he's in the area, where'd you go? Oh, sorry, you're in the area that's being proposed to be purchased. Okay, in, yes. In, in order for this uh, to go through, every property owner would have to buy the property and the adjacent property owner, in this case yourself, would have the first right of refusal. That's the way it's proposed. And so even though you didn't sign the petition, you'd be entitled to purchase the property if it's passed. Any other comments? I'm Brent Wallace, and I live on 10481 Canterbury Drive, which is actually off the map, but is connected uh, pretty much directly to this trail and to the park. So that's, that's my dog in the fight, so to speak. Um, I'm a pro-open space, pro-trails person. Uh, my wife and my grandchildren and I and my dog use this trail regularly. I don't list those in any particular priority. But I can get to the park without virtually traveling on any road. So it makes it safe for young kids and me and my wife and my dog to travel on this trail. And my biggest concern is, is that this will be like a cheap sweater that you pull on a string and it'll start unraveling. Because as was already stated, so not to, to restate too much, but why not the next section and then the next section and when I came here, I knew this, the open space system was here. I expected it to stay. I didn't expect it to have a fuse on it that would get lit, and then it would slowly start to disappear as people that moved in and knew that it was there disapproved of it and wanted to do away with it. So um, 
Uh, I think the survey for that, and I don't know how much the survey would cost, but that'll all need to be surveyed. So I imagine the homeowners will bear that cost as well, not the city for surveying the property. Correct. I believe that cost is shared actually with between the city and the property owners. Okay, so there's a little detail maybe that needs to be addressed. Um, I think there, there was a- I think that's already been a precedent, Brent. That's the way all the okay, other properties okay. have been handled. But, but that's just, a, and I'm sorry, Brent, to, Go ahead. I think that needs to be clarified because I've never heard that if the, the yes. city was going to participate. Is that, Nathan, is that correct? Is that how it's been done in the past? That's correct. Okay. Um, I saw the 39% the, uh, that did not approve of this, and I was never approached about signing anything or approving or disapproving this. And I think that maybe a lot that approved it thought, well, this is in somebody else's neighborhood. It's five blocks away and I don't have to worry about it. But I think we do need to worry about it because you'll be setting a precedent here that's different than any that you've, of uh, these trails you've removed before. Those were all exceptions. Those were all strange circumstance properties and trails. This is a major trail to this park that uh, there are alternative routes to the trail in the winter in that cul-de-sac the snow is pushed into the end of that cul-de-sac and you cannot reach that park if there's a big snow bank there and most people want to stay off the more the busier road so you will be setting a precedent here that could affect all the trails in north canterbury south canterbury and potentially highland uh, brent could i just clarify your you your, your last point uh, this property proposal is actually only eligible for neighborhood option trails and if you look at Canterbury, the trail going kind of northwest from the park out to the hollow is the only section of the trails in Canterbury that's eligible for purchase. So it does not set a precedence. It's already been established that it's only neighborhood option trails. And so it could continue across the street, but again, it would only run, it would run basically perpendicular to the park out to the hollow, and that's the only property that's eligible. How so it does ago, not set a precedence. How long ago was that designation for optional for neighborhood? That was approved in 2013, six years ago almost. Actually about five and a half years ago. So then that can be changed as well because that was a new regulation. So somewhere down the road somebody it's can save their It's actually an update all. to the master trail plan. But that's, that's open to being changed somewhere down the road. And you know, there's nothing, the that, there's nothing that's <laughs> static with the okay. city. Okay. <laughs> so, so what I'm but saying currently, is... Currently, there is no precedence with this that would affect any other trails in Canterbury. Un until that rule gets changed. Well, possibly, it, potentially changed. That's true, but we would ha still have to go through the public hearing okay. process okay. and all the other processes that require changing the general plan or the, the master trail plan. What if... To back, you know, I guess that that doesn't apply because there's only one person that does not agree is not signed on to this. So there would not be two houses back to back, in which the property neither of them wanted to buy this property. So Nathan, that's the next question. When I knock there, I understand there's one property owner that's joint tenancy, that the husband and wife are not in agreement. So we might have a signature of a husband, but we have a wife who's joint tenant that does not in agreement of having the purchasing of the trail. I raised that question, so I, I'm just, that is a concern of joint, now I understand they're gonna say joint tenancy of, this is not them saying, hey, can you do it? This is of a purchase and a purchase agreement. The reason is they pass it the attorney. You can't purchase property, it, it, whatever that title is gonna be is whoever's gonna be on that name. So if it's joint tenancy, they can't sell their property with, if, without having their husband and wife sign. So I don't know why we're assuming that we're gonna go take them, that they're gonna do it as a joint tenant. We've caused a divide amongst the husband and wife there in that neighborhood, just so we're aware. Well, and one other the question that Scott brought up, Mr. Hansen, was what's the purpose of this? Is if it's just people want bigger backyards, um, is this in the best interest of the entire neighborhood? Um, or Brent, is it in I, the interest of... I don't mean to interrupt again, <laughs> but I don't know if you read an email from Jeff Martin. I don't know, if is Jeff here tonight? Jeff is here. It would, it would really be helpful, Jeff, if you could come in after Brent, Thank but I won't, I won't interrupt anymore. But I, Jeff addresses the reasons for the disposal, and I think his email puts it very succinctly. Okay. But what clear. Brent's bringing about, there's some, it's not the trail, it's that they would desire to have a larger property. And in speaking with some of those property owners, that is a true aspect that they would prefer 
they're, one of the reasons they're doing it is to get more property. So we can't discount what his feeling is, what he's stating. I, I let, 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 me, let me just add a rebuttal to, to Kurt. <laughs> I, I have a trail behind my home and I've tried to make the same effort. The problem that, that we have, and I'll use the word as, that I've used repeatedly, and I'll, I'll look directly at the camera so I get uh, scruffy again, but the problem with the trails within most of the subdivisions in the open space area is the trails look scruffy. We've lived by a scruffy trail now for over 16 years, and we're tired of it. We've already established that the city can't afford to maintain it, and we're anxious to acquire it so that we can maintain it so it beautifies the whole, in, whole community, not just our subdivision. And so that's the main driver. I've also chaired the Open Space Committee, and we've talked to residents both within and without the Open Space Community, and it's pretty much universal that we've got to find a solution to this. The community's got to step forward and make a decision. Are we going to have scruffy neighborhoods because of these trails, because the city can't afford to maintain them, or are we going to step up and allow the residents to buy the property so that it looks decent? So your home value is increased because the neighborhood looks nicer. I think that's one of the underlying concerns that I have. And again, I'll defer to Jeff to let him address some of the other issues. But I think there are some compelling reasons other than a land grab. And, and quite frankly, having worked with the city, had a very difficult time working with the city for 16 years, the land grab is the least of our concerns. We're anxious to resolve a problem that makes it look scruffy. And I'm just sick and tired of scruffy looking neighborhoods. So Can with I address that particular comment? Yeah, because I was going to mention, it's not, I don't think it's just this one specific trail area. I think most of oh, the trails in Highland, it's, we, it's, we're not the best stewards. I, I mean, we need to be better, doing a better job, and I'll discuss that later on, on some plans to do that. I have a rake and I have a lawnmower, and I think pretty much everybody in the neighborhoods do. So why can't we come together as neighbors and have a project where a few times a year we rake those out, we cut the weeds down, we take some responsibility as good stewards of our neighborhood, and we take care of that scruffiness ourselves. Why do we want to have to be relying on the government to take care of that when it's really, I do it all the time. I have Highland property behind me. You know, I've already you know, brought this up in a previous meeting. I take care of a lot more square footage than they do there on that trail. And, and Brent, let me address that quite quick, or very quickly, but the Open Space Committee actually had a, approved a maintenance agreement so that property owners could come in and maintain the property. Prior to the maintenance agreement, we were told not to do anything with it. In fact, I was told at one meeting, city council meeting, not even to step on that property. And so there's been a very adversarial relationship between the city and the residents adjacent to this property. They, there's, they haven't allowed them to improve it, and when they have, they've, there's been issues of encroachment on city property. So there's a double-edged sword there because we have to deal with encroachment, which is a, a legitimate issue in many cases. In others, it's just an effort to try to make it look nice. And so there's a, there's a difficult issue in terms of defining what's improving, what's encroaching. The maintenance agreement did not, was not received well because people didn't want to invest thousands of dollars into something that wasn't theirs. And, and so it, it failed miserably. Uh, I personally have a maintenance agreement and I maintain part of my property, but there's a ditch there that I can't maintain. And so there's issues in stepping forward and maintaining it like a good citizen because, again, the relationship between the city and the adjacent property owners and encroachment issues that, that are being addressed right now with the city. So there isn't a simple solution to that. It's not just simply saying, let's be, all become better citizens because that does not address the issue because there's other issues dealing with encroachment that haven't been addressed. Let me just say something too. I, I think we're forgetting the fact that the residents in these neighborhoods pay $240 a year to maintain this property or to have the city maintain it and it still isn't maintained because there still isn't enough funds to do it. So, you know, I understand the angst. I've sat on that committee for many years myself, and I've just heard the concerns of people about security and maintenance and all these other things. So we worked hard to come up with some options when I was on the council before, and we went through the whole master plan of the trails. And I love trails. I use the trails. But, you know, a city like Highland that doesn't have the finances, we can't have as many trails as St. George, which we had at one time. 
So this is a very small area of one neighborhood, this neighborhood option trail. The goal is not to option all those others. You've got the Murdoch Canal Trail, you've got several other trails in there that will not have any opportunity to be optioned by any reason. So, you know, I just think there's a concern from the neighborhoods that I've heard many times that, gee, we pay $240 extra, which is what a lot of people in the city pay in property tax to the city, and it's still not maintained. So this was an effort to kind of work with a solution. Not as a, it's not a land grab, in my opinion. It's a thousand square feet for these people, and they're willing to take out the trail and do all this work. Any other comments? People getting Brian? it out of the paying the two hundred and forty dollars? No, they're not. No, so that's irrelevant, and actually, right? No, it's not irrelevant because it's land that's never been maintained in the first part. So. You know, I'm not sure that your suggestion that everybody can get out with the wheelbarrow and clean it themselves is, is really going to fly with a lot of people. So uh, It just depends if they want a scruffy yeah, right. piece uh, so, of property. But, uh, this is your time, not the council's time to argue <laughs> with you. I, I've, I've checked with our police chief, and crime is no higher on open trail areas than non-open open trail areas. So. The safety issue is, is not really a, a relevant item as well, but I would like to see them stay. That's, a, that's an entranceway into that large park there in which everyone can enter that park without ever uh, walking on a major street. Okay. I, actually, you had to walk across Canterbury Place. Thank you for correcting me on that, Ed. I appreciate your uh, And actually, there's, side, there's two adjoining sidewalks, so you have three parallel access points to that same park within about 125 feet of each other. Well, like I said, and, and one so of them is blocked in the need, nearby snow and one is on a busier street. Not only redundant trails, so we need three trails to access the same point in the park. To me, that seems overkill. So, I, I'm not, I, council, I, 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 let's I just let the people talk and respond to questions, but not add commentary, please. Uh, fence heights and city watch, I mean, neighborhood watches can be employed to help make all of our trail systems a better place for all of us to live. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jenny Roos. We live, um, the Canterbury Park is right in our backyard. So it looks like before we had our fence put out, our kids looked out and they said, someone's on our slide. And so that shows you how close the park is to our backyard. And the people in the neighborhood, let me just preface it with this, they're some of our dear friends. And so we're very open. We've read the petition. We um, are open to both sides of the story. But I will tell you how we feel now is that we like the trails. I have three kids. We have two foster kids. We use the trails often. We use them a lot. And I feel safe knowing that my kids are using the trails to go to their friends' homes. And also, I want you to just know that um, some of the people that signed the petition thought that they were signing the petition to have it considered. They didn't realize that they were signing the petition, let's do this. So I think that people were unaware. I've talked to a few people that said that they, because um, we're all friends, so someone comes up to your door, I want you to sign the petition for this and that. We're like, well, of course, I like you. I value what you say. Under pressure, you sign the petition. So I think a lot of people are unaware of what they were signing. Thank you. Can I just make quick, one quick comment? Uh, the petition actually is a petition to bring it to the city council. The council actually has to act on it before anything's finalized. And so the residents can't approve it. The council has to approve it. So I, I really don't think there's a misunderstanding because there has to be a petition. And you have to be in favor of the petition. And the petition may or may not pass depending on the vote of the council. Yes. 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 Exactly. Uh, my name is Jeff Martin. Um, so uh, one of the questions that was posed kind of, uh, I guess, just a bit earlier by Brett was, what are the concerns uh, of those who, whose property kind of abut against the trail? Um, I sent a, a very detailed email to all members of the council this morning. Hopefully you had a chance to review some of that. I'm not going to go over all of it right now. I'm just going to highlight just a few of the important points. Um, so for me, um, this definitely is in no way a land grab. 
Um, mine is the only house that is not a Rambler um, on, on the Canterbury Court side of the street. And so as a result of that, we have one of the largest yards of anyone in the neighborhood. And I have no desire to mow any more lawn than I'm already mowing. Um, so with that in mind, um, why, why is this important to me? So safety, I don't think is anything that we should ever disregard. Um, there have been several instances where people have, have traveled from the, the gate that adjoins the trail through my front gate because it's a straight shot. And so they just go straight through. Um, I have not reported that to the police, so there's no official report, but it has happened. Um, I also have some concern for the safety of those using the trail and also my property. Uh, and I have a, a shed and, and, and many valuables back there. Um, and regardless, safety is, is something that we should always consider, whether that be the maintenance of the trail and the safety of the trail itself, making sure that it's plowed, making sure that there's no ice on the trail, um, but also just the individuals that are actually traveling on the trail as it can be secluded depending on, on the heights of the fences. Um, maintenance, so I, I definitely own my own weed whacker. It's one of the high-end ones and I use it often on the trail and I have no problems doing that. Um, but at the end of the day, that's not my property and that's not my responsibility but I still do it because if I don't, the weeds come through the back fence into my yard and it becomes my problem. Um, there was one instance where I was cited by the city because I, I, I own an apple tree and as a result of owning an apple tree, the weight of the apples naturally bring the branches down. And so there's one point where they're hanging over the, over the sidewalk a little bit low and I, I agree they were a little bit low and so I was asked and cited by the city to go trim those. And so I did. Um, we have two very large trees in, directly behind the fence that are between, in, that, in that little strip of yard between the fence and the trail. Those trees have never been pruned, not even once. And they hang right over the trail. And, and for me, I mean, I, want, I, I have no desire to ever leave Highland. I've lived here for six years and I plan to live here for 66 years, at least. Um, I love the city, it's a great place to live and I wanna keep it that way. And for that to happen, we need to either allow the homeowners to maintain that property or get a commitment from the city with an audible and actionable way that that's gonna happen. Um, with regard to the signatures from the community, I, I personally went out and gathered approximately 25 signatures. Um, the people I spoke with, I brought a map that was colored and showed exactly which section of the trail would be removed. It wasn't a, a quick process. I, 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 I had a, a good conversation with each person. I do think, to, to Jenny's point, I do think there are some people who, if they recognize you, they're gonna sign. They're like, oh, I know that person. I'll, I'll sign, sure, why not? Um, but I do think the majority of the people that I personally spoke with had a very good understanding of what they were signing. Um, and regardless, at the end of the day, we were asked by the city to go and get 60% of signatures. That was not an easy thing to do. It was very, like I said, very time consuming, but we were willing to do it because, because we feel passionate about, our, about the city and about the property that, that adjoins our property. Um, When I was talking with folks to go out and get those signatures, um, out of the 25 signatures that I obtained, there was only one person who told me no. And the reason they told me no was because they wanted to, ins instead of removing the trail, they wanted to fix the problem. And I think that is very commendable. I think regardless of, of what side of the fence everybody is on, we should want to make things better. And, 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 I, and I applaud that, definitely. Um, my last point uh, that I'll share is, is that this is not a new thing for Highland. Um, I have here an article from the Daily Herald entitled, Highland Open Space Encounters Problems. Any guesses on the date of that article? <laughs> I think some of you probably know because you've, you've been on the council for quite a while. Um, 
So that article is dated October 2012. So nine years ago, and the title is Highland Open Space Encounters Problems. The first, I'm, I'm just gonna share uh, just a couple of points from the article. The first line says, Highland plans for open space aren't turning out as everyone would like. And I think we can all agree with that. It's not turning out how we would like. Um, and then it says, regarding maintenance, the city has been maintaining the parks and open spaces this year, but there have been complaints about the quality of the maintenance, which I think we, we've, we've already established. Um, and then regarding safety, the article is talking about the height of the fences and specifically the open space fence ordinance and states the reasoning behind the open space fence ordinance was to preserve, preserve the view of the trail and not create alleyways where joggers could not be seen by nearby residents and perhaps be in jeopardy of attack. However, this has also created a lack of privacy and security in the backyards abutting the trail. And so again, this is the same issue. The reason I'm sharing this, right, is, is this is an article, again, from almost a decade ago, and yet we're still in this room talking about these same issues. Um, and then finally, towards the end of the article, there's um, kind of a quote from a city councilman from Highland that says, the city is obligated to maintain too much open space as it is. We need to get rid of some of the open space and having individuals maintain some of it for us is a good solution. And then at the very end of the article, it says we are now in the process of addressing these problems. And so again, uh, my reason for sharing that is that here we are a decade later trying to solve the same problems. Um, I would love if, if we could solve this another way. Um, but given the history that we have here, it's hard for me to believe that this one single petition is going to be the one that changes things for Highland to where we have trails like we've never had before. I, I have a hard time believing that, that the city is going to have the resources as, as the asphalt deteriorates and as there are continued problems on the trail. If, if there were, heaven forbid, to be a serious safety concern or, 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 or something happened to an individual that involved law enforcement, that, that would be horrible for all of us. And I think if we look at this, this, this part of the property, I'm 100% sure if it's given to the residents that it will be in pristine condition. I don't know if you've ever seen the lawns along Highland, but they look very nice. And, and they certainly will if they were given to the city. If it, if it remains, if the land were to remain with the city, I have no guess as to what it will look like five years from now. And I don't think any of us can confidently say that it's gonna be well maintained. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. My name is Anthony Stevens and my wife and I moved in in July and we live on the trail that's uh, what we're talking about this evening. Um, we've hit on the maintenance portion of the trail over and over, so I don't want to hit on that too much. The part of the maintenance I do want to talk about is, uh, and it was brought up that everybody, you know, if everybody came out with their wheelbarrows and shovels and everything, problem is I don't ever really see that happening. And what we're running into is we're having to not only go out and take care of the weeded area in, uh, that we're talking about, but also picking up trash that gets dropped along the trail or picking up dog feces that gets dumped by my fence as I get ready to go out and use the weed whacker or whatnot. Um, so that's all I want to bring up as far as the maintenance of the trail goes. What I really want to hit home on is the security. And for me, I've got three young children as most people in the community do. But for me, I don't have a sense of security or a good solid peace of mind when my children go out to my backyard to play which is where the one area of the home without actually being inside my house, I should feel safe that my children are out there playing. Uh, with the short fences back there and that trail being open to anybody and everybody who would like to come back there, I understand there's not any real re um, reports out there police-wise of crimes committed back there, but I certainly don't want my, any of my children to be part of that first report. 
So for me to feel safe, I feel like I have to go out and sit on the back porch and watch my children play. And that's my cross to bear for being a sheriff's deputy for Salt Lake County for the past 20 years and working inside a jail for 20 years and dealing with the best people in the community. So because of that, I tend to be a little hesitant to, uh, and maybe a little overbearing on watching my children. So Anthony, thank you for your service. One of the questions I, when I visit, how tall is your fence in the back versus what might be the option you could go to? It's three feet right now, sir. And I understand we can go up to four feet with it being blocked, but that's still pretty short in my opinion. And I feel like if we make it too tall, then the, it just becomes an alley and then the safety of people on the trail itself are not as safe either. So, but I don't want to take too much time um, and I just wanted to hit on that part. So thank you very much for your time and your consideration in this matter. Thank you. I'm Katie Spens, and I also live um, their backdoor neighbors, Stevens backdoor neighbors. We're actually moving soon, so I don't want to like be too strong one way or the other because it's not going to affect us um, once we move. Um, but I do want to say, hitting on the safety issue, I know there may not be police reports out there, but we have had um, times like the Stevens before they moved in, the Schulteises who lived there before us, they were out of town for a week, and they said watch our house for us and we did have to run someone out of their yard um, it was snowy and we saw footprints and there weren't supposed to be any footprints back there because they were out of town and there was a person that was casing out their house um, because we the stevens and us are right on the um, corner there of canterbury place and the trail and so our our lot our backyards our back doors are able to be seen very easily from the street so people can easily see oh no one's you know been in that backyard or whatever and they can easily access our back doors through through our low fence or our gate the other issue is for me with the maintenance is there are like potholes on the trail there are big tree roots growing under the trail and so you know unless we have a plan going forward where they're going to be able to tear up the asphalt and redo the sections that are starting to deteriorate or take care of the tree roots that are making um, like tripping hazards and falling hazards. My, my kids are maybe clumsier than other people's, but I have had two children break an arm on the trail or, or an ankle tripping on their scooters. So there, I think that is a valid issue. I, um, and I don't feel like um, as of yet, the city has put forth a plan um, of being able to um, afford to maintain the trail. As for like the trees and things along the trail, I know they say there is a sprinkler line there, but nobody has come through to like check that the sprinklers actually work. So we have a sprinkler going to the one tree that like we can see from our backyard that's along the trail that's owned by the city. And that tree is big and beautiful. And the other trees along the trail are like literally half the size because they're not regularly watered. Um, when the water comes on, you'll see it like spurting out randomly here or there, but it's not not every tree has a sprinkler going to it and they're they are not pruned regularly they're not maintained when branches have broken off we've had to go and take them down and take them to the dump or to the city dump site in the spring so it is a lot of maintenance for those of us who live on the trail and we've actually started putting like our grass clippings back there to try to like get the weeds to not grow so high because our kids get their feet full of stickers every time they go out the trail to the trail and where there's already two other access points to the park, literally within you know 15 feet, um, I just think that we're not um, necessarily doing anyone a disservice by um, getting rid of that open space, and that it would look better and be more well maintained if it was maintained by the homeowners. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Go ahead and sit on the front row if you're interested in speaking then that'll make it easier so my name's Tamari Stoker I think you're gonna see different opinions depending on where people live so I live on Canterbury Lane and I back up to two of the trails and the straight shot that they're trying to get rid of is where my kids run to the park all the time um, I think if we're concerned about the looks of the property that is behind the fences I think that's a different issue because even if you take out this property, what about the other trails? How are you going to maintain those? Um, the second issue is safety. I am all about safety. I have four kids, eight, 
all the way down to three. So safety is an issue, um, which I totally agree with. I think we should amend the fencing law and say that people can have six to seven foot privacy fences without it being open, the remaining 20%, I think it is. So those are my two thoughts in regards to this. Thank, Thank you. you. You were next. Hi, I'm Richard Miller. Um, I live on Sumac and I'm at the top of that green line. And then the, the circle is my neighbor, the Gerlots, where the city granted them the option to buy that piece because that particular piece of the trail went to a dead end, which makes sense to me. Same with the Stensons who live on the street, kind of perpendicular in the middle of the green where the trail hit a dead end and to a fence line, so they were able to purchase that piece. Actually, the Stensons just have a maintenance agreement. They did not purchase that okay. property. But, it, but it, I would think that would be a great opportunity for the uh, Stensons I, to purchase that piece of property. Yeah, um, you know, friends of ours are all of those wanting to buy this piece of property, so I'm in opposition to that. Let me tell you, when they came around, Ryan came around to, with the petition to sign, I, I didn't pay attention. That's my fault to what the petition was because when he presented it to me, I assumed that he was buying the property from his property line to the trail. And, and that made sense to me. And I wish that the city would look that and consider that as, a, as an option for us as homeowners, that we could buy the property from our fence line to the trail, and then we have to then maintain it. And then you'll find us, in addition to the $25, you find us for not maintaining the, our pieces of property. So that's one option. The, the other thing that this, this, this uh, lady just mentioned, I, I do think you could increase the, the, the height of those fences to give them more security and more safety in that process. But I, I can't imagine it being more safe to take my kids on a street than, than on that trail. And, and so that's one, one point I wanted to hit. Another couple of points I wanted to hit, and Brent hit most of these, so I'm not gonna repeat them. I've been a resident since 2004. And I run along, run along those trails um, three times a week during the summer and the fall time. And I don't want to have to necessarily change my routine to go from my backyard down to the trail and then back into, an, into a subdivision and a cul-de-sac and then hit the trail on another side. So, again, this is probably a little bit about me right now. But I'm one of those residents that feels like I bought in Highland for the purpose of having access to open space and trails. And that was one of the biggest drawing points for me to, to purchase here in Highlands because I knew I could run on these trails and take my family on those trails without any hindrance of, of going into a busy traffic uh, area. I do know we have, to tr we have to travel across certain, certain streets to get across on the trails. Um, another piece I wanted to mention is, I hate this iPhone 10, is the fact that um, we, we understand there's a lot of traffic toward the park end. And I think we as neighbors can do a better job at supporting them with neighborhood watch, with other uh, options to help uh, ensure that folks are not going into the trails that are on the parks that are not supposed to be there or doing the things that they shouldn't be doing in that area. So I think that's, that's a part back on us. Um, another piece I wanted to just mention, I, I'm going to hit a couple of these points. That, I'm not going to hit these points that Brent brought up. But uh, let, me, let me skip through those. Just, I guess in closing, I would ask the city council, the mayor, to, to open this up a little bit uh, more for discussion and not vote on it this evening. And I know that several people I've talked to in my neighborhood assumed kind of the same thing I was assuming. The Barkers coming around, great friends of ours, presenting a petition, and we're not paying attention to the, the, the complete petition and what they were asking. So that's on us. Um, but 61% of the folks signed the petition, not, not in the high 90s, not, not the, the low 80s, but 61% signing this. So to me, it doesn't have an over, overwhelming uh, approval for all the residents in that community. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jason Flint. I live in the neighborhood. Um, I actually back to the Murdoch Canal Trail, so I have a connection with a lot of the concerns that have been expressed um, back into a public space. So I just want to thank you for your attention, and it's, it's a topic that's going to recur, has 
come up several times in the last year. So um, I'm, I'm grateful you're considering all of the options and, and deliberating it and uh, all of the avenues you have, including open space. Um, I just wanted to, to just add my plus one, me too, to several of the comments. Um, in particular, I, and, and forgive me, you may hate me. I'll, you're going to think I'm a terrible human being and a terrible neighbor. Um, I did not sign the petition. Mostly driven out of um, unanswered questions. And so several of those have to do with, is this really the best first option for our community? Um, several of the concerns are recurring concerns. Maintenance being a very large topic. We've heard that to no end. And, and um, I can completely understand that because we've clearly been deficient in that in the past and probably into the near future. So we do need a way to address that. Um, I would prefer a solution maybe that addresses it citywide rather than a street by street. I think that would be overtaxing for this committee uh, and the council. Um, but the topic at hand is this particular street. And so as one who lives in the neighborhood, I would add that my family also uses it. We moved in 2015 into the neighborhood. One of the main draws was, in fact, the trail system. I have three young children, 10 and younger. And as, as they grow up, um, we do encourage the use of the trail because it is safe. Uh, children aren't particularly cautious at times crossing driveways. Um, when they're on a scooter, foot, bicycle, that's not the first thing on their mind, even though as a parent, it's my main concern. And so knowing the trails are available as they go to the, the park or to an activity at the local church, or even to friends' houses, um, there's a lot of peace of mind in being able to help them cross the street and then know from there they've got it. And that provides them, I think, a sense of independence, which in most neighborhoods um, I would not be able to allow. So I would, I would plus one to that comment. Um, and as far as frequency of use, um, I, I think the trail system's a unique thing, uh, so it's gonna have unique challenges. I think it's sort of a paradox. The more you use it because you enjoy it, the less you like it, right? Because it causes all of the peripheral problems. And so I think we're trying to find a balance as a city. And I would hope that as, as we look at options, it shouldn't be the default option to just get rid of it by eliminating it. Um, in this particular case, I just have a few questions. It, and I would also add, you don't have to hate me forever, if it goes through fully in support of it. Because I, I also believe the community should be able to make that decision. It is designated um, as something that they can decide on. And so what I would prefer is, is a bit more of a discussion. Um, I only ever heard about it once back in April from Ryan. I think I was actually weed whacking my park strip, which by the way, I don't own either, but I do maintain. Um, and, and he just said real quick, look at this petition, and I had questions, so no thanks. And that's the last I heard of it until I got a letter last week. And so um, it piqued a little curiosity. Um, so with that, I, you know, I started thinking about it. What kind of questions would I have? If this does go through, um, a lot of the questions have been raised. I won't repeat. But um, one of them would be, would there be time requirements around reclamation and landscaping? The community itself, when installed, did have requirements around when landscaping would occur. And, what type of fences would be allowed and where they should go. So would that be in place here also? Um, would there be a bond posted by, with the city by each adjacent property owner for purchase of the land, but also reclamation efforts and any associated costs that have just been brought up since Thursday around sprinkler removal? Um, so how can the city guarantee that they're not going to lose the money? How can we also guarantee there won't be or orphan plots in the middle? Um, I mean, we just heard testimony from one of the adjacent landowners who is not even on the petition and whose purchase would be required for this to proceed. So there's a question in my mind around that. And then one last question, and this may be an open space question. I'm, I'm new to the council proceedings, but uh, the proceeds from this purchase go to the city. Would those funds be um, allocated for maintenance or upkeep of remaining green spaces? And, and is that an option for Again, future? The, the quick answer is they do go into a fund for open space in general. So yeah. they, they, can, they sh should be used for capital improvements as opposed to maintenance. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a great answer. Because um, one of the questions is, does it disappear into a general fund? or No. Um, does it address the problem that this is trying to fix? It doesn't address that problem, no. Not, not specifically around the maintenance, no. Um, last comment I would make is that park in particular is a very nice park. I feel it is maintained well. I think it's a draw for the community, particularly for the neighborhood. It's the one thing that made me keep driving circles in that neighborhood until a for sale by owner popped up. And um, it is well maintained. And to, to remove public, safe public access for young children to the park, I think, would be a disservice if there are other options. 
And so thank that's, you. That's my comment. Josh, you just got to call out you and your team. Good job. Take, Josh is the person who takes care of our parks. He doesn't always hear the uh, the positive things. Many times it's why is it uh, dry and not not the way I want it. You notice he took his hood off when he, when, when he said that. Well, by the sound of things, uh, it sounds like I should become a door-to-door -door salesman because everyone's buying what I'm selling without checking on what Say it your is. Name. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, there's, there, are, there are a lot of people that we love in here and, and, and appreciate. And just a few clarifying. Um, Excuse me, can you state oh, your name? Ryan Barker. I, li I live on the pathway and one of the petitioners here. Ryan, the reason why we ask is this is recorded. Okay. And people can't see you. If they watch the video, they may recognize you. But the uh, recording is the official piece that we put on our site. So let's just make sure people know who you are. Okay. But thank you. Uh, we appreciate your time um, taken tonight, and I think just to address a few of the concerns that were brought up um, tonight about um, just the amount of uh, you know am amount of signatures we were able to obtain um, after hundreds hour of hours of work to you know get people home on, during the summer. Um, you know we got to our our 61 percent or whatever or whatever that was, um, and I think of the 90 plus signatures I had. I think there were four people that you know, rejected uh, me that didn't want to, didn't want to do that. <clears throat> and, and Mr. Wallace, you said you were one of those that wasn't contacted, but um, to refresh your memory, you and I had talked about, it, I think for about a half hour with my little boy there, Austin and our red side by side, and, um, you know, happy to revisit those things that are important to me. And I think the, the biggest thing that we'd like to address is, you know, I, I understand where, you know, everybody that is coming from that, that has an opinion here tonight, and that's why they show up. Um, I would just ask that the council consider, you know, what might be the most important issues in this in this factor and, and why this decision would be made. And uh, like I said, in good faith, we relied on um, what we believed was the precedent that was set in that the, the council um, had an ordinance where it said the city council of Highland City finds that providing procedures for removing neighborhood option trails and disposing open space property is beneficial to the residents of Highland. Um, a system was laid out, and we, we followed that, and we did our job to, to get to this point. Um, outside of that, I think, you know, the primary issue for us, because the question of safety has come up several times, um, is, is, is just that. Um, I, 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 you know, speaking from experience, we've had uh, four different break-ins at our home, um, all coming from the, the trail. And uh, you know, I was on the on the phone with my wife once when somebody tried to come through our our back basement door, and uh, I know it's convenient to be able to walk down our pathway, um, and and I know there's concern about uh, precedent that's being sent, but I I do believe that with our adjacency to the open space to the park, that we are a unique case, because there are a lot of people that come from outside of our neighborhood that go there. And there are a lot of those people that one way or another make it down our dark pathway. And um, just to reinforce, uh, you know, the, the, the safety issue and, and some of our concerns, we happened to run into a friend that we made who was a police officer um, several years ago, a retired police officer, Cal Miller. The reason we know him is because we had to call the police so many times because of the issues that we had. And I do believe they're unique because of our proximity to the park. Um, but that's why I'm asking that special consideration be lent to us in this, in, in this particular location and that safety be put um, above convenience in this, in this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Merrill Frost. Uh, we live in the green section there uh, on Canterbury Lane. And like Ryan just said, we think highly of all of our neighbors, appreciate the time to address uh, the council and the mayor and, and uh, city employees. One, well, there are so many things that I'd like to say that I will say via email to the city council, so you guys, because it's probably not time effective here, but uh, one of the main things uh, that I have question about and concern about is we came to Highland almost five years ago and a large reason we came was because of the trail system. And we have kids that go down that trail and head to the park. And uh, I love the fact that they don't have to go out on roads. Um, contrary to what some other folks have said tonight, I feel 
extremely comfortable and safe with my kids in my backyard that butts up against that, that trail. Um, maybe it's where we are, maybe it's other factors, but I've never seen or heard anything that would give me any kind of concern. Highland is a great uh, safe city to live in. Um, what I'd like to address is just the fact that I feel that this, for me personally and my family, is an either or or an all or nothing proposition. So that if you're gonna um, allow this to take place and block the access that I have to the park, then I think you'll find uh, those of us in the green section there, even though it's forbidden by ordinance right now, you'll see some pressure. I, actually, it's not. It, that, that green section is actually part of the neighborhood option trails and that is eligible to be purchased. Okay, because I understood that to be green differently section. in the, in the no, conversation prior, prior to it's that. It's just the yeah. green. It, 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 it's the trail that runs out to the hollow. Okay. That's well, I, I, for me, if I don't have access to go that way, then I would probably be desirous to have um, the ability to put up the type, type of fence I want and to quite honestly, not from a lab, land grab perspective, but to be able to take ownership of that land back there because I maintain that already. And if I'm maintaining it, I just feel like yeah, I would be able to, to have it for my own as well. Um, we've lived here almost five years. In those five years, there have been no sprinklers that have hit those trees. Uh, I watered those trees myself. And I know for a fact that they're dry um, because they've never come on. So I don't know if there's another issue that's going on that with that. Um, but I just wanted to kind of ditto what uh, Brent Wallace and Rich Miller also said, that there are some concerns, and I think we need to look at it more deeply before we just approve it right away. Thank you for your time. Thank you. My name's Cal Miller. I was called by Mr. Parker there to give my elaboration on it. Safety-wise, yeah. It's but all of them are bad too. Um, I've been in, called by Mr. Barker numerous times off duty because <laughs> I know him more, real well and I know his family real well. And we've had to call our guys to come down and you know address the situation. But when I've been working, because I work day shift, night shift, and as the chief would, you know, knows it at the same time, yeah, there's a lot of people that do not live in the city that walk that trail for reasons who knows. But, you know, there's probably not a lot of police reports on it. But when you stop one because he's looking over somebody's yard, I got every right in the world to find out who he is. Now, I'll call in the dispatch. Dispatch would have that record. I'll notate who he is. And if I see him again, then I'm going to get a little bit more suspicious. But... Everyone that I've stopped and asked what they're doing doesn't belong to Highland City. They've come from Salt Lake, they've come, had them from Midville, I've had them from Heber, I've had them from um, Linden, Provo, Spanish Fork, all over the place. I know the police chief probably knows the same thing. They're there for one reason. They're not there to visit somebody, they're there looking for something to take. And with all that space, it's easy pickings. So, yeah, safety issues now. You got kids running around, it's easy to grab one. It's just a big safety issue, right? And it's going to get worse. So, Ryan asked me to talk to you about it. And yeah, there's been quite a few down there. I've stopped them at night when I was on graveyard. I've stopped them during the day when I was on day shift. So, there's a lot of people that in that neighborhood that don't belong to Highland. So, Thank Thanks. You. My name is Jenny Hansen, and um, like my husband said, we're the ones that didn't sign, mostly just because we have a lot of questions, but I just want to add two quick points. We've lived in this home for 14 years. We've not had any crime issues, so I know some people have had issues, and I feel badly that that's been their story, but in 14 years, we've not had any problems. Um, and in fact, we were out of town over the weekend and I looked out my back window today and our shed door that opens to the trail had been wide open all three days that we were gone and nothing was gone, nothing had been touched. I feel like it's a really safe area. Um, the other thing I just wanna add is how much use this trail gets. We have a giant sliding glass door out of my kitchen. I'm looking out there all the time and a big patio we're outside in the summer, in the warm months all the time. And there are people, our neighbors, our friends back there all the time. 
we don't see people we don't know back there. I just think that um, to make it sound like this is a crime-ridden alley is not correct. It's friendly faces. It's the sense of community that we get in this neighborhood. And I mean, like, it'd be great to have a bigger backyard. Don't get me wrong on that. But I just think that for the neighborhood as a whole, it will, it'll leave a mark if we get rid of it. So thanks for your consideration. Thank you. I'm Early Barker. Um, we actually live right on the corner, if Ryan explained that. And I just, I feel like we need to kind of make sense of this whole discussion um, for everyone, if not just for, for the council tonight. But the reason this even started is we've lived here now for 12 years. We knew absolutely that the pathways were here. We actually lived across the street and built the house across the street before we moved to, to California for several years before we moved back. Um, we were very aware of the trails and the pathways and we did enjoy them until it has become a further problem you know as the years have gone on it would be nice if it was a friendly neighborhood gathering all the time but as Jenny just said it's it's not fun to sit in the backyard or have just a moment with my child to jump on the tramp or blow bubbles and have several people walk by as we're going along and I can't ever have Oh, no, no, I was saying that you said it was friendly people walking and that they can be friendly, but there you are with everyone else. You don't ever get a, a private moment with your family. And that's, that's our concern and that is, that is our point. Living right there, we're living in a fishbowl. We're, we're living in a fishbowl with everyone else. Again, we were aware of that. We weren't aware of the, of the safety issues and the risks that we were gonna take by living there. Being on the park, as, as Officer Miller talked about, We've called them several times because there, it's not just the break-ins. We had people walk over our fence and walk down into my basement. That was the first time we got to meet Cal. Um, but people in our garages, every time they're open, people stealing stuff out of, our, out of our car. So it wasn't just Ryan saying people are coming into our house like we're just an open book, that that's the issue. It's the variety of people that are always there. The park becoming a very public place where people come in the summer very random family reunions that come into my yard, ask to use my bathroom, you know, ask for water. It's just a very public place. So we've tried to see if there's any way to make it more of a, a livable, safe place for my family. I've been raising five children here. Again, it's not a place that I feel like I can go and enjoy with my children in the backyard or on the, on the side. So to sum it up, that little part, I agree with everyone who has a discussion about any other pathway, and they have the right to come to you and discuss that later. Tonight, we're just proposing the red area. The point of that is where we live right there, we feel very strongly like you brought up, there's other accesses to the park. Where we live, people can come and use our front yard, which we will happily take them walking through our front pathway. The back way, there's also where the Hansons live on the Canterbury Lane. Everyone can access those two. The people who have said talking about going safely through the pathways, they still have to cross the main roads to get to our pathway. So our pathway isn't like connected to all these other roads. It's its own separate place, which if people have to get down there with a seven foot fence, it is gonna become a dark alleyway. It already has become a problem with the park being there and people coming down the pathway at night. We don't want to have lights going into each other's homes at night, so we can't have motion lights out there bothering each other. Um, and so there's really no other way, unless one wants to go stand on the trail every night, which we do not. We want to be able to enjoy our lives. We want to be able to feel secure. We want to be able to feel safe just for a minute with our yards, be able to enjoy it. Yes, maybe have a little bit bigger yard. That's not a problem if we are the landowners and we maintain it. And I think the issue of this is tonight, we're just asking for that portion tonight to be able to maintain it, to be able to make a yard where it's safe. And safety is the number one issue. And for a mom, that is what this is about. I've been accused of coming out to get bigger yard, and that is silly. But yes, I wouldn't mind having a place to play with my children. But bottom line, it is a safety issue. I want to raise my family in a safe, beautiful place as Highland with the security of knowing that my backyard is somewhere that I can be with my family, feel secure, and feel safe as much as we can in a public park right there. So I think that's kind of bottom line is none of us are, are fighting anything else that just asking for the unmaintained area back there that we might be able to make it a little more secure and more livable for those who live there. Thanks. Yep. 
right. I'm Candace Miller. I actually don't live there. I'm married to Cal. So I want to address what everybody else is afraid to say. There is garbage on that trail. There are drugs on that trail. There are people that don't belong on that trail. There are pedophiles watching for little children on that trail. It is very uncomfortable to think that. So unless you guys want to fund to pay more police officers to run 24 seven on there, why not give somebody that their backyard is directly on it, give them the opportunity to take the measures to protect themselves. Because no matter how many police officers you have, there's not enough to cover everything. Everybody is worried about somebody getting a little bit of extra property. Well, that's great. But the bottom line to it is, is if they're going to take care of themselves and their neighbors, because they wanna, everybody's quick to push that, oh, this is not gonna work. <coughs> that's probably the neighbor that's been looking out for you. That's why you still have all of your items in your shed, because all of your neighbors were watching your shed while it was open. But allowing all these people to come from all over the place, it's open to everybody. It's open to anybody in the state of Utah, anywhere who wants to come, is allowed to walk there. And when you're that close to it, it makes a big difference. I live on the trail. It's right behind my house, okay? I'm okay where I'm at, but certain places are not okay. I don't have little tiny children <coughs> either. And I'll also say that. I like to go outside and <coughs> lay in a bathing suit. I have a yard where I can do that. Unfortunately, I'm imagining none of these people have the privacy to sunbathe in their own backyard. That's probably everybody's bad on the city, where they put it, and maybe they should have lined it up a little bit differently. But the bottom line to it is, is it's pretty, it's a pretty safe community. But if you were to look up sex offenders in Highland City, you would be shocked at how many there are. And most of them are looking for young children. You already have a park. Why give them a narrow area to find their, to look for children in? It makes me sick to think about that part of it, but nobody else is willing to stand up and say that. They're like, oh my gosh. No, we are in a bubble, but there are bad people around no matter how nice your neighborhood is. So I just think that if you're giving people an opportunity to purchase that, to maintain it, take care of it, then allow that, allow more people to do it, honestly. That's about all I have to say about it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Bronson. I live on Canterbury Drive, so not adjacent to the trail, but definitely a heavy user. We've been in our home for almost eight years. So, uh, I can appreciate uh, the difficulty of uh, this decision. A little bit about me, I work for one of our state's non-for-profit healthcare systems and I manage a book of business. We have about 1,500 employees and about $250 million in revenue. We're a non-for-profit entity and so a lot of the things we do are aspirational in nature. They're not done because of economic reasons. And um, so we're faced a lot of times with decisions um, similar to this one where Maybe we've set out to do something because of, um, we've said we value something and we set a stake in the ground and then a little bit later on there's some difficulty. And then we have to ask do we scrap that program or do we tweak it a little bit? And to me, this feels a little bit like the city is capitulating on uh, a good idea and something that uh, was highly valued when it was put into place. Um, because of really an easy solution to get rid of uh, a, a, you know, a couple hundred yards of maintenance issues. Um, it does feel like this trail is a little bit of a linchpin because of what it does for the rest of the neighborhood in terms of the connectedness. And it feels like it is, there is a trickle effect that if this trail goes away that it will be um, the message that the city council is sending to the city is that you know the city would like to get out of these arrangements because there's a difficult maintenance, a difficult economic problem, and we're not sure we value this in the same way that we did when we instituted these trails and these open spaces. 
Um, my confidence in the city is a little bit uh, lower tonight as I, um, I also was not, I live in the neighborhood, was not approached uh, about signing the petition and so just got the letter last week, had no idea this was up for consideration. And I have a lot of questions about the process in general and about these designations and what the city's uh, uh, process is. And I think it would benefit from a lot more of conversation. Lastly, on the safety issue, um, I think, you know, you have a few hundred yards of trail here that you're hearing some safety complaints about, but I think what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So if these trails are truly unsafe, we probably ought to get rid of all of them. And then is that the headline that we're comfortable with? Highland City's trails are unsafe, so the city's just gonna let them go up for sale. And I, I don't, that to me sounds a little absurd, um, but I think these problems probably exist for everybody along the trails. Honestly, except for Ryan uh, talking about his break-ins, None of the safety issues I've heard are any different than the ones I experience with people coming into my yard that I may not want there or coming into my garage even has happened before. Um, it's just part of uh, living in a neighborhood like the one we do. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'm Julie Stevens and I live on the mm -hmm. corner on the other end of the park in the red area. My, I just want to address one thing is that within a quarter of a mile is the dip behind Smith's. And apparently there's a proposed a great big reservoir with fish, a beach. We're inviting people from all over the state within a quarter mile of me and my three young children to start walking those paths. So we may not have great safety issues recorded, but we do have potential for that, that we're going to welcome anyone on those trails in the near future. That's just my concern. It would be very close to our home. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm here in Council, I'm Neil Evans, and I'm probably the only individual here tonight that, that is, uh, doesn't live in the Canterbury area. But there's, I think there's an elephant in the room, and I think it, it, it should be addressed to Todd over here. You talk about a $15,000 possibility of abandoning a sprinkler uh, within that area. And it was my understanding, as I have looked in subdivisions in the past, that you have a, an easement that surrounds those properties 10 feet around every yard on every, every lot that's in the city now. And that trail is apparently only 20 feet wide. If each property owner was to uh, take half of that, that's 10 feet. Well, you've got an easement that's back in that area. Why can't that... Uh, sprinkling system or that water line be left within that easement and not have to be there, not have to incur another $15,000 in expense, either through the city, through the sale of the property that you're getting, that you are going to do that, or that you're going to put on these um, eight individuals that are uh, trying to re replace that. So uh, I, I would just ask that that sprinkling system, because I think that'll come up once you Close, close the public hearing, it's going to come up and you will be speaking about that. And I'd just like to hear about it on, on what the plans are and why that has to be moved and why a $15,000 possible expense has to even be considered at this point. Thank you. Can that be addressed or is I just, I just uh, drop that? Sure. That was Great a question. question. I'll, I'll address that. We avoid having are our main lines behind any homes because once once we sell this property off and we don't have access all of you residents will actually fence that uh, that's the assumption hopefully you won't leave the corridor there having purchased the property with that being said this is not a deep line and as you put your fences in you'll be augering through our line you can only imagine the the this is a, a larger sprinkler line this isn't like a home line it's a main line for our parks. And what would happen is you would have that high pressure line in your backyard and we would have to access through your yards every time anything happened. We'd have to get in there, tear up your yard. Right now for the city and for your benefit, the best thing to do would be abandon that line and connect in the street where we could own and maintain it. And it's easier for us, it's easier for, your, for you. I know it's an expense, but it's the right thing to do for the community and for you. Thank you. 
My name's Brandon Long, and I live in Canterbury also, and I don't have a problem with it being sold. I think it's a little redundant to have the access when you got a sidewalk on the other side of the house. Personally, um, I understand some people's concerns, but I want to shift gears a little bit. I'm not going to cover anything that's been said. I actually live on 10626, which is on the northeast, about in the middle there on the northeast, and there is a trail or city property behind my home and there is no trail there. It's grass and I maintain it. In fact, I spent a couple hundred dollars last year putting the sprinklers in it and repairing it. And it's, I'm maintaining it. What do I gotta do to get on a petition so I can purchase my property behind my home? That's my concern. Anybody? If you wanna attend an open space meeting or get a hold of me, we can discuss that. Okay. Rather than do that during this meeting. Okay, thank you. You can also call staff. They'll help you. Yes, definitely. Anyone else? Okay, I get to use my gavel again. Public hearing closed. Council, um, discussion is yours. Uh, Mayor, I, I'd like to jump in and make just a few comments. I'll try to be brief. Uh, try not to be too wordy, and I'll try to say scruffy only a few times. Uh, to start with, let me uh, address some of the issues that have been brought up, and I'll, I'm not going to address them in any particular order, but... The one thing that I would avoid is trying to sensationalize this issue. Uh, the only trails that have been designated open space or de neighborhood option trails are those trails that don't have a, a, a specific destination or they're duplicate trails. They're also trails behind homes. And so there's the, ma the majority of the trails in the city uh, do not go behind homes. Uh, and privacy uh, has been a, an ongoing concern with the, the homes behind. Uh, the trails behind homes. Did, and, can I? Did you say most of the trails don't go behind homes? That's what I said. Well, okay. let, let me let me clarify. Within parks, there are trails around that that, that homes back into, but there are, there are parks uh, where those occur. Uh, but but again, the perimeter trails, uh, the the trails that we're talking about here, uh, those are the not the majority of the trails in Highland. Uh, even the, neighbor, the 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 uh, the canal, the the Murdoch Canal Trail, is behind homes, and and so I, I do need to clarify that. Uh, but those are large trails, uh, or either along the Murdoch Canal or around parks. But let me just mention one thing, uh, well, several things. The Open Space Committee was established a number of years ago and worked for years discussing different options, and so this is not a new issue. It's been vented. Uh, extensively with open space residents as well as non-open space residents. Uh, mayor Ritchie established the committee when he was first uh, elected as mayor. We looked at a number of options including the maintenance agreements, uh, the neighborhood option trails and ultimately the purchase was a joint discussion between the open space committee and the city, city council. And again that was established back in 2013 uh, almost well, five and a half years ago. To date, there have been eight subdivisions where these trails have been approved for purchase. Uh, again, these, uh, these have all been neighborhood option areas, and they've been very successful. And in fact, any of the contention or concern by adjacent property owners or property owners outside the subdivisions has, has faded away. So, Ed, let me ask you, though, on most of those trails, I'm not aware they were asphalt trails. I understand they were but, not, not put in trails. Is that correct? They, they were all designated as trails. I don't, I, uh, some of those had asphalt, uh, not many of them, however. Uh, but it's been very successful in the eight of the nine that have been, there's been one that has not been approved that was rejected. Uh, and again, it's been very successful. Canterbury Circle was the first subdivision to have approved, and uh, th that was a significant amount of property that's being purchased by those residents. The third point is that the the state of Utah will not allow trails to be designated as safe routes. Uh, the, the school districts have been required by the state to designate safe routes to the elementary schools and, and other schools, and trails specifically are not allowed as safe routes. So even though they appear to be safe, the state of Utah will not allow them to be designated as safe routes. Again, because you can't monitor what's going on in a trail like you can a sidewalk. And in Canterbury, specifically, there are sidewalks throughout the entire subdivision. And so any safe routes by the state would be defined as those sidewalks within the subdivision. And I'll, I'll just 
insert a, a quick comment about my own subdivision. Uh, many of you are, I, I live by many of you, and the Sandstroms, who is a name familiar with most of the people here tonight, live on a trail and their home was broken into within the last few months by accessing their home from the back door again off the trail that's in their backyard. And I believe that is an official police report. The fourth item is that uh, the city has struggled financially uh, to maintain the trail since I moved into Highland 16 and a half years ago. And from my perspective, it's beneficial to determine how much we can afford and then eliminate what we can't afford so that we can maintain what we have at a higher level. Uh, specifically, uh, the city is looking at potential deficits as, as near as the next couple of years. The council is already evaluating a potential fee increase for public safety. Uh, and these parks, the, the property that's being sold can generate revenue that can go to parks that are undeveloped or partially developed. For example, Beacon Hills has a partially developed park, which is part of the open space community. And the revenue from the sale of this property can go towards improving parks that many of us feel like will never be developed in our lifetime unless we de uh, come up with a different source of funding. Uh, my own subdivision, for example, would yield a significant amount of money that could go towards the Mountain Ridge Park. Uh, the sixth item that I wanted to talk about was uh, privacy. Uh, everyone that I talk to that has a trail in their backyard, again, that isn't around a park or in a major trail, complains about the privacy issue. When you have a neighborhood or a family barbecue, you, it's, it's like you're inviting everybody that walks by to your barbecue. And I, and I know that's an ongoing issue. Uh, and then uh, this particular trail is nor narrower than normal. I believe, or someone already mentions, it's only 20 feet. And again, to me, that, that creates an additional safety issue because it is so narrow and makes it very difficult to monitor. And quite frankly, most people are in and out of their homes and it would be very difficult to have a neighborhood watch on a trail behind a home as opposed to a neighborhood watch on a sidewalk where people are driving by on a regular basis. I believe that those are all my comments. Um, let me just interject, Ed. I, I just went through and mapped all the trails in the city that are asphalt. I took out all the sidewalk trails and I am pretty certain that a majority of the trails that aren't asphalt do are against or near somebody's backyard. I, I literally just went through and did that for all the trails. It's on Google My Maps. I've shared that with all the council. And my, my sense is that a, a, a sizable majority is of the not sidewalk trails are backyard trails, and that's about 20 miles of trails um, over about half of those trails, a little bit more than half, are, are in open space neighborhoods. Anyway, that's just a comment. I, I think you had indicated earlier it was about 25 to 28 percent that were in the neighborhood. Um, uh, the open if space if you take out the, the, we have trails that are designated city trails that are part of open space and connector trails like in here, uh, those if you exclude those, it's about, now I've just tweaked the tip, about 30% of the trails are open, in open space uh, or against open space lots. But the, uh, if you put the city trails back in and the connector trails back in, it's a little bit over 50% of them are in open space. And again, most, again, just my sense, um, I didn't measure it and count homes, but I, my sense is that well over half are in backyards. And, and again, I, I, I wouldn't disagree if you include the park property and the Murdoch Canal properties. Yep, I included all the trails that had asphalt. Um, any other discussion? I'd, I'd like to make a few comments. Um, the Open Space Committee was established when I was on the council before in 2010, and I participated on that committee on a regular basis for many years. And the purpose of the Open Space Committee um, was the following. Um, I think the idea of open space is wonderful. And it's one of the reasons that I live in Highland. But I also think 
that when you have open space, you have to have a way to maintain it. And the people in this city are very conservative financially. When I was on the council before, there was an effort to try to raise property taxes for the roads, and there was a referendum and defeated. There was a road fee that was defeated. And, and so, you know, we don't, uh, people in the city don't want a lot of commercial development. But I find the city here, uh, the people in the city want all of the amenities and they want everything maintained, but there's no money to maintain them on a regular basis. And we've tried to be very careful and there's uh, been, the city also has worked really hard to eliminate debt. And, and if we follow the plan that we're on now within about nine years or 10 years, a decade, all the city debt will be eliminated bond wise. And I think that's laudable. So the big question that we, we brought up, and I was on the council when we looked at all the trail system, I love trails. I'm on that Murdoch Canal Trail a lot. It's soon gonna go through my backyard. But uh, at the same time, that Murdoch Canal Trail is 22 miles long. It's gonna connect into a bunch of other trails in the state. That runs through this neighborhood. You've got a bisecting trail here that's not gonna be disturbed. It's not a neighborhood option trail. So we looked at some of these other trails that were causing a lot of problems. One, we can't maintain them, a lot of security issues that we've talked about. And so we put forth some new ordinances to give the option to the people in that neighborhood if they went through certain requirements. And, and these eight owners have talked to many, many of their neighborhood. And just because you're not on that petition in favor doesn't mean that you're opposed to this. And you know we're looking for solutions to these problems. And I think it's easy to say, oh, we're gonna find the money and maintain all the trails great, but we have yet to find it in 17 years. I think it would be better to have fewer well-maintained trails, put our money to maintain all the beautiful parks we have, and, and keep our taxes low. So I favor eliminating this little piece of uh, trail because then, People that live there have done their homework. They followed the ordinance. They followed all the steps. And it's great to have a discussion here today. I like to keep all of our trails, but if we don't have a way to maintain them and make them safe, because the answer is not putting seven foot fences along them because it creates alleyways and makes them less safe. So if they can't be maintained, let's let the neighbors maintain them. And I'll, I'll uh, add to Ed's comments about this idea of scruffiness. It does not enhance your property values to have unmaintained trails and having people all over using those and, and decreasing security of your uh, lot. So having sat on the open space committee and heard the complaints for many years, I think this is a good option. I don't think it's an option for all the trails in the city, just for a few problem areas. Thank you. One, one thing uh, the council, and this just happened in December, but the council will have an opportunity to decide is starting July 1st of this year, the county is implementing a quarter cent tax for transportation. And to Highland, that will mean about $200,000 that can only be used for roads, trails, curbs, and sidewalks. So there is some money coming that um, call it a gift from heaven or manna from heaven. I mean, it's coming from us, but it, it, it's coming in, and the council will get to decide how they want to distribute that money. Currently, in this year's budget, there's forty-three thousand dollars allocated towards trail maintenance. Um, that means we could put a significant dent in the deficit of trails by using part of that two hundred thousand dollars that we'll be, we'll be getting that annually. Now, if kind of economy crashes, that will go down. But as the economy continues to grow and, and we, as the county, continue to grow, that, I would anticipate that money increasing over the years. Anyway, this is a comment. Let me um, address a couple issues that have been brought up. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for being here. It's, it's really nice. Most of the time we come in here and, and we sit with a bunch of empty chairs and we talk to them and they don't really respond well. So it's really nice that you're here. Thank you for, for taking the time. Thank you for having some passion about something that's important that's impacting your lives. Um, the things that I want to address, um, I've been on the council for a little while, and when the 
uh, canal, the Murdoch Canal Trail was being built, um, there were a lot of people who came in who lived next to the trail who were sure that the um, sky was falling because the trail was connected to a lot of different cities. And so all the riffraff of every city was going to come through their backyard and we were going to uh, significantly increase all of the, the thefts and the rapes and the child stealings and all the other kinds of things that would happen. And, you know, it's a, it's a concern as, as a uh, parent, as a neighbor, as, as residents in this city to have crime coming into the city. And as I did research on it, um, by far one of the things that most people want are trails in their cities because it brings an appreciation in the price of their property. It brings peace. It brings a lot of good things with it. Are they perfect? No. Do they bring some problems? Yes. But we've had the Murdoch Canal in place now for years and years. Uh, I'm a runner. I've run on all the trails within Highland City. Uh, I know how many uh, routes are sticking up through the asphalt. I've tripped on many of them. I usually run early in the morning, so it's hard to see them. Um, we are a bad neighbor from, from the fact that we aren't taking care of them the way they should and not setting the right expectation. But I asked, uh, about a year, a year ago, uh, one of the subdivisions was coming in and they were saying that the trails are unsafe. And as you heard someone state earlier, if they're really as bad as, as they're being portrayed, then let's get rid of all of them. Because it makes no sense to keep them if they really are as bad as, as they were being portrayed. So I turned to Chief William and I asked him if he would look and see if that's really true. And it wasn't just with this subdivision, it was really go through the city, because we have lots of trails in our city. Go through and look and see, are they an issue? Because most of the trails, uh, aside from uh, what Mr. Dennis said, most trails are in people's backyard. Now, are trails not safe? Are trails safe? Are there going to be some problems? You can't live in any city in the United States that you're not gonna have some problems. But I asked him to put together a report. He provided me that report. And there is no evidence that any trail in Highland has a higher percentage of break-ins or problems of criminal activity than anywhere else in the city. It is not true. And the reason why I'm trying to make that a big issue is because I don't want that to be perpetuated through the city. It's not a true fact. The fact is, they are not less safe than not having a trail. Now, does that mean that you, does that mean that somebody wouldn't do that on your property? No, it doesn't mean that. But if they walk in your garage, they're walking in through your front door. Can they jump over a fence? Absolutely. Are there people that are going to break into homes? Yes. But the fact of it is the Murdoch tra Trail is actually safer because there are more people there who are actually watching. We have good people that live around our city and other cities. And the reason why places are safe is because you have people watching. They don't like to be there where there aren't people. We have lots of dark places in our city because we have chosen not to put as many lights as other cities. And the reason why we've chosen to do that is because we believe that you should be able to see the sky at night. It has its issues. There are people who are frustrated because they feel like it's not as safe because we don't have as many street lights as other cities do. But the fact is, is we've been named one of the safest cities in the state. Again, uh, if you've been out to the mayor's blog, you've seen the posting that he's listed there. Does that mean we have no problems in our city? No, it doesn't. If you'd like, I'm more than happy to show you and give you the information that uh, Chief William provided me. And I'll, I'll share it with anybody that would like to, but it, we went over a year period from April of 2017 to April 2018. I felt like that was a big enough time frame that you could get a good feel of, of where the things, where the problems are at. So I, I just want to make it absolutely clear. Trails do not increase safety hazards or safety problems in neighborhoods. It is not true. Okay, and if somebody can provide me statistical information that shows otherwise, 
I'd love to see it, love to share it. I'm in for the facts. I'm not taking a position of one way or the other. I want the facts. And that's why I went to, to Chief William to find out what the facts were and not what people are concerned about or worried about. And I want to um, lay that fact out there for you to know. Second piece is when we created these trails, there's a huge misperception. When these trails were created, they were created to be built with natural vegetation. You probably all heard that if you've spent any time looking at these trails. What is natural vegetation? Well, it's sagebrush and weeds and other kinds of nice things that look pretty on a piece of paper because the, the developer wants it to look nice. So they put it on there. Well, any kind of plant that you add water to is gonna grow. And if you put weeds out there, they're gonna grow if you put water next to them. You go out into the desert, you'll see natural vegetation. It grows based upon what water it gets. You go up in the mountains, it grows based upon the water it gets. There was never an intent, there was never a plan to make a park type trail through everybody's backyard. There, was, there were not sprinkler systems put in your backyards to water lawns. They were put there to water some bushes, they were there to water some trees, but the expectation was never there to put grass in there. If you have grass right next to dirt and you start watering the grass, I can guarantee that some of that water is going to get on the dirt. If the water gets on the dirt, it's going to grow weeds. As a, as a bad neighbor, we have not taken care of that problem. But we did not allocate money to take care of those weeds because there weren't supposed to be any. It was supposed to be natural vegetation. There's no cost in natural vegetation. The natural rain takes care of it. It takes care of itself. Well, it was a huge fallacy, big mistake. And, and we didn't see it as a city. And we haven't addressed the issue. And, and that's bad on us as a city, we did not and have not addressed that issue. But the money you pay wasn't intended to cover the costs of a nice gra grass path through your backyards. It was to take care of the few things that we have on the trail, which should be the asphalt, which hasn't been taken care of. It should be to maintain any weeds that would be in there, but we didn't expect there to be as many weeds because there's a lot more water going in there than, than what we ever anticipated. It's to take care of the parks. So the costs are significantly higher than what they were originally expected. And we didn't, we didn't manage that well. And, and we haven't taken care of you. And we haven't tried to address all the issues that, that need to be addressed that, that, we're, that we're seeing now. When, when we talk about um, this particular trail, we have never removed a trail, to my knowledge, and I'm more than happy to be corrected, we have never removed a trail that had asphalt on it in any of the open space property. We have sold uh, to eight subdivisions or eight open space areas, we have sold property that were supposed to have a trail built. The developer never built the trail or it was just supposed to stay nice, natural um, land, natural vegetation, and it turned out to be a bunch of weeds. Those are the pieces we looked at and said, are we ever going to build a trail? And we recognized that they weren't. The first trail to come, in my, in my understanding, to come before us was Wimbledon, and we turned that down just recently because it is a trail and it had asphalt on it. This would be precedent setting if we were to do this because it does have asphalt. Now, is it the end of the world if we do that? No. But it is setting a precedent as a city that we've never done that. Part of the reason why I know that is because we've never had to discuss, well, who's going to remove the asphalt? We've talked about it, but we've never actually had anybody do it. We had to go through that with Wimbledon the first time when we, when we went through that process. It's north of the Robinson property. So as we're talking about, um, right I'm guessing, Ed, you'd like to contest that? Like I said, I'm more than happy. No, I was, just, I was just making a comment. The property north of Robinson's along the Alpine Highway, there was a small section of trail that was asphalted. They were going to move that. I'm, I'm not sure that they ever exercised that option, but there was a small portion of asphalt trail there. That was to provide access into the Robinson's property from the north end. Yeah, that was for their subdivision that they didn't pursue. Right. 
But that but, was approved and there was an asphalt trail there. As I've said, we've never, a trail has never been removed that was asphalt. But, but it was approved to be removed. Could be, could, that one could be removed. When we talk about, yeah, and, and considering the size and what the use of it was, it's not like any other trail that we've talked about as well. Um, I think it's important that, that we address some of the issues that were talked about here from the perspective of uh, safety. And there, there are safety issues in a trail, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, staff, on a trail, they can have a five foot fence, or is it six foot? So on adjacent to trail, it's gonna depend on how wide the open space area is. In this particular location, they can have a six foot fence, four foot solid, the last two feet being 55% open. Or they can have a six foot that's open, more open. Well, that's correct? what I was explaining. Right, well, you saw it on foot. the bottom, but open on the top, or you can have open slats all the way through at six correct. feet. I, I okay. thought we had fixed that. I That's what we fixed it to. It used to be yes. four feet. No, it used to be four. And then so, we had, to six, but the top two have to be open. Right. 55%, yeah. so half. Uh, yeah, we, or, need to, we need to. Or you I can have it open all the way through, just a certain amount. The issue may be that from a, from a comfort standpoint, you know, maybe we look at that and try to address that issue. Not maybe. We should look at that and get your input so that we can have an environment that, that is comfortable for you. There's nothing stopping you from putting bushes in front of your, your um, fences on the inside. There's nothing stopping you from putting other kinds of physical barriers. If you want to go out and sunbathe in your backyard, you can put a physical barrier that people can't see. Any of my kids go out in my backyard and want to sunbathe, the homes, the two-story homes, everybody can see in my backyard if they wanted to. Now, I don't have any fences. None of my neighbors have fences. So, you know, from my standpoint, I'd love to keep it that way. I've got deer roaming through, and I'd love to get rid of those deer. A fence would stop them. But I don't, I don't have the fences. But if I did put a fence in, my neighbors could all see inside of my backyard anyway. So when you talk about certain kinds of things, a fence is not the only way to solve a, an issue. Is it an issue or is it a way to solve it? Partially. But again, when we talked about putting these fences and we talked about the changes before, we talked specifically about the height of the fence and the impact and the safety that it would cause. You start raising the fence too high and people can't see in or out on either side. It becomes a safety issue, which is why we discussed what we did. And so we don't want to create a corridor where it it's begins to cause a safety issue, we wanna make sure that it's safe on both sides. So talking about the fencing, I think it's awesome that we have that discussion. And, and there may be some things that we can tweak. As a city, the reason why we went to this open space, and I have attended almost every meeting that the open space committee has had since its beginning, so that I could hear what residents wanted to, to express and what their concerns were. I don't live in an open space, but I felt like it was important as a councilman to be engaged in that. And so I have been to almost every single one of those meetings to hear it. And there, were, there are some absolute legitimate issues, but part of it is, is we created an environment of open space, and anytime you create something new, there's always going to be issues. And so we created this to, to alleviate some of the problems. Well, the fact that we created some of these plans to fix the problems doesn't mean that those plans are perfect either. So including a trail or including a plan that can eliminate trails, we've had some time to think about it. And that doesn't mean that this is the right thing to do. And we're looking at, I tried to uh, put a moratorium so that we could address this a little bit better um, a month ago, which means that you you don't let anything else move until you can address whether this is the right thing or not. And it didn't pass. I believe that that was a mistake. I believe that we should have the ability to take, a, take some time and look at some of these things and see if it's still appropriate to have this policy to eliminate trails. And if so, which ones do we eliminate and which ones don't we? There, I still think that that overall this committee and the things that they were trying to address were the right kinds of things. Eliminate the properties, 
that really have no benefit to the city. They're sitting out in somebody's backyard. Nobody gets access to it. The only people that see it are the people that live in the home. And all it is is weeds, so all they see are a bunch of weeds. We can't get back to them. It's too hard. We don't water it. We don't do anything with that property. So to me, those are, those are some key pieces that I think are, are critical for everybody to understand and have some context of, of what we're talking about. I'm concerned about eliminating this trail. There are a couple of reasons why. One is we talked to, it was brought up by Kurt um, that one of the neighbors is not uh, necessarily going to buy the property. That, in, in my opinion, is one of the key components of any property that we've ever talked about selling. All of the property has to be sold. We're not going to have a checkerboard where the city owns one little piece out in the middle of the trail and everybody else has, has um, taken offense and locked it off so we can't get to our piece. All of the property has to be sold to even be a consideration. So unless that's the case, it's, it's off the table for me. Second piece is, as I'm listening tonight, I feel like that, that some of the percentage of neighbors um, are not clear or in alignment with what they necessarily signed. And I feel like that that needs to be addressed. I also believe that as a city, we put some things in place and I, I think it's disingenuous for a city to put things out there, policies out there and just arbitrarily say, no, we're not going to do that this time, or yes, we are going to do it. Okay. You know, we need to have consistency as a city. I appreciate your work. And, and I really appreciate the petitioner and those who went through the effort to do this. The time that you have spent doing this, it's not fair as a city for us to just jerk you around. And, and I have a real problem with that. And to to not allow this to go through, the threshold has to have at least some level of height for me to say, let's, let's put some brakes on it so that we can see that, that we're doing the right thing. But it is the policy, or it is where we're at. Now, there is a clause in there that allows the city council to look at each situation and make a specific decision on that particular piece. That was intentional so that we could make sure that if we were making mistakes, that we could stop it in the middle of it. And so that's always been in there. It's why we're having this discussion. It's why you're here. And I'm grateful that you are here to, to give your, your concerns. Um, I also am concerned about the fact that if this is sold, it, it creates that other piece that we talked about that could come up for petition, the value of, of, of that particular one as well. And I see this as being that next step of where uh, it begins that ball rolling, and I, I don't know why the neighbors there wouldn't come in and petition the exact same thing. And frankly, we don't have a way to stop it other than have this discussion, and then the council can say, no, we're not going to do it. But it's not, again, it's not fair when we're asking you to go out and do a bunch of work. You come in, and then we, it feels like we're jerking you around because we're, we're not following through with what we asked you to do, and that's, it wasn't a small thing the time and effort that, that you put in uh, to go get that information. Um, there was one other thing that I wanted to um, address. Yeah, one, one last thing. There are many residents who have moved to this city specifically because of the trails. And um, I believe that, that one of the things that makes Highland great is the trail system that we have. And we have been poor neighbors and we have not taken care of the trails and we have not worked closely with you. And many of you have stepped up and, and taken care of the trails. What we will never be able to do is we'll never be able to take care of all the trash and all the problems that are gonna happen in the city. We have volunteers that come into our parks and help clean up the parks. We have volunteers that will go along the roads and help clean up the roads. There's never going to be enough money that you're going to be willing to pay in taxes for us to hire enough people to take care of those. This is, these are our trails and our parks and our streets. And as a community, there's a certain level of what we need to take care of. And sometimes if you're living next to the trail, you're gonna feel more of that burden. 
uh, because it's going to be in your neighborhood. I don't think that's right. And I think as a city that we should be able to do something to help uh, organize that, help provide materials for, for those who volunteer and other kinds of things. I think that's the right thing for us as a city to do, but we will never have the kind of finances in this city with the type of residents we are. We're conservative. We're not out to paying tons of taxes. We're in it for low taxes and to be able to have a community type of feel. Um, so that's where I'm at on, on the discussion that we've had. Uh, Mayor, just one uh, quick follow-up item. Sure. Uh, let me mention to the, the group here that I did misspeak about the trails behind homes because obviously there are a lot of trails with most of the trails have homes behind them. But let me add this, this qualification that the, the homes where there are trails behind them that I'm referring to are where there are fence restrictions. Uh, if there is a fence restriction, those people have privacy issues. So if you can't put up a six foot privacy fence and that's any trail that's less than 40 feet in width, I believe that's the criteria, then you have issues in addition to that those type of trails are the majority of the trails that are not maintained. And, and if we were to eliminate any trails, it would be those trails where there are fence restrictions that the city does not have funding to currently maintain. So I, I apologize for that misstatement, but I do want to clarify what, what I'm talking about because it is strictly those areas where there are fence restrictions. Then thanks for the oh. clarification, Mayor Thank you. and Brian. Um. Did you have anything? To add? Uh, just, I'll just say that I think the council has covered most of the areas and interest, uh, the uh, issues, so I'm not going to repeat them. Uh, I do think we must address maintenance uh, of our trails throughout the city. We have to, we have to get get that taken care of, and I'm not talking about the natural growth. I'm talking about the um, uh, asphalt. The natural vegetation? I'm not talking about the natural, Those beautiful the weeds. weeds. I'm not talking about the weeds. Um, we do have to address the fencing issue. Uh, I think that privacy, it, I don't know that it's a, a real safety issue. Uh, it can be perceived as a, as a safety issue, uh, but it is definitely a privacy issue that we need to address. And in this particular case, uh, I'm you know, we are taking a, a, just a portion of that trail out and not the whole thing. And I do think that Brian is right. It would just lead uh, to the next step of taking the rest of it out and why we wouldn't do it all at the same time. I don't know. So uh, those are my concerns. So I appreciate all of you guys live in the Marie Johnson property. You probably aren't familiar, but Marie used to own the 200 acres that Canterbury North is on. And I used to visit with Marie many times. And, I've, and as I went, I, I visited with about 19 homes yesterday. And as I did, I think Marie would be very pleased with the individuals that have moved in on her property. Marie has now since passed. But uh, as I went into the Canterbury North, I always knew it was a nice subdivision. But as you walk and you meet the individuals, you find the quality that everyone talks about that we see in Highland. And so one of the things that really, I guess, pulls at my heartstrings is to see an issue the city brings about that divides a neighborhood. And this seems to be one that as I did knock on several doors, this is a one that was a divider. Meaning that as I went, and I mainly stayed on Canterbury Lane or down in that little cul-de-sac, and I saw that several of the residents had strong feelings about keeping the trails. Their kids would use it for their bikes. They felt that was the safe. We had others that would, I would visit with. It was the concern about their children playing in the backyard. And so as I listened to that, so as tonight, I look at, you know, I think we've already talked about some of my concerns as consideration is we have those trails still going to the west. Once this trail system is re removed, it kind of hurts that whole trail system, which is a, uh, you know, going, going to that, I think, which the council's already talked about. The other thing I look at is that if you moved into a home that had a field next to it, I think all of us would assume that there'd be homes that would be built there. I don't believe a lot of people ever moved into Highland and saw trails that that would be an assumption that they would believe that the trails would be removed. So I think that's where we see some of this emotion come out of some of the different residents where they're your good neighbors, but that, that was emotion that they bought into when they bought their home. 
the maintenance issue, I do agree with the council. I've only, I'm the one that's a short-termer. I've only been here a year. There's some others that have much more wisdom. I am very worried that this, this has been going on for a long time. And I'm going, am I really the council that's going to come and I'm going to be able to do something we all think we can? The only thing that gives me any hope is we is trying to, it's not always funding, but can we get a mechanism? The mayor brought up about the quarter percent sales tax. Not a big fan of everyone getting taxed, but we happen to have one that's going to be coming in, starting to come in, that has to go to either trails or sidewalks or roads. And, that, and, and so I'm going, as one council member, when I vote for Wimbledon, which I, when I walked in that, that subdivision, I love that subdivision too, but when I voted, I also recognized that I'm creating a problem if I don't come up with a solution. And so I also recognize if I vote to say no, I've got to think about the solution at the same time. Um, as we also look at it, since I am the new council person, when I campaigned last year, it was the open space that Evan says, will you, if you get on, will you defend the open space? And that was something I did agree to do. And I believe that the, the trails are part of that open space. It's that field, that highland that people have bought into. And so those are kind of some of my, my thoughts as we kind of look at this. It, it, it's, a, it's a heart jerker because it tears the community apart. I'd like to make a couple more comments. Sure. Um, you know, again, I like the concept of open space. I, I think the problem with the open space neighborhoods has not been a concept or the open space. I think it's been a design issue. Um, we actually eliminated the ordinance that would allow open space neighborhoods when I was on the council before. And so we've kind of evolved into other things. Um, it's always disconcerting to me a little bit. I don't live in an open space neighborhood. I've, I've tried to find some solutions here. But, you know, and I appreciate Councilman Braithwaite being real honest, but it's a little disconcerting to me when we tell people that there was never an intent to maintain the trails in these neighborhoods. And because I think there has always been an expectation set by the people in these neighborhoods, in the open space neighborhoods who pay this $20 a month fee, that there would be a little better maintenance. Now, I'm not saying bad things against our staff because we have a small staff with limited means and they can only do so much. But when we tell open space neighborhoods, your park is public for everyone, your trails are public for everyone, but you get to pay the $20 fee. And that originally was set because you're on smaller lots. But we've done a little bit of early looking at different things, and some of these homes pay as much property tax as I do, and I'm on a half acre. So I think we need to find solutions. So some of the solutions are, do we find more revenue? Do we find more staff? Do we maintain these trails better? Do we change the fence ordinances? We changed the fence ordinances when I was on the council before, but do you create alleyways? And there was a lot of concern about that too. So my feeling is, is if we can't maintain everything we have, it makes sense to let some of the neighbors in these problem areas purchase that property. Those funds will go into the fund and help maintain other areas. And um, I think it's great we've got this $200,000 more coming in, but we've got a lot of bad roads in this city that I think need to take precedence. So my feeling is, is this was, and Councilman Irwin and Braithwaite were on the council when we crafted these ordinances and we had a lot of discussion. And I think it's fine to go back and say, well, maybe we need to change them again. But the people in good faith in this neighborhood have followed the ordinance as it exists. And then we doubled the price of the property in the last couple months, and they're willing to pay the double the price. So, you know, I, I think it's hard for you to talk to all 200 homes about this little short trail. I mean, that's why we set percentages, because these big neighborhoods, you just can't do it. I mean, it's just impossible. So I just want to say this is a solution to a problem. It's not a land grab. There's alternate routes into this park. You've got the Mur Murdoch Canal Trail in your neighborhood, which is marvelous. And plus you've got the other trails that are never gonna be optioned. So I think it makes sense to option this portion and maybe the whole thing at, at one point, because it really doesn't go anywhere, to be honest. It doesn't, it connects into your park and that other trail, but really, you know, so I think we need to use common sense unless we have a way to pay for all these amenities. And I can't see 
the enthusiasm in the city to come up with a bunch more revenue. I've just never seen it since I've been on the council. So that's my opinion. I would like to move the question. Sure. I'll second that. So what, what question are, what, what's the motion? I will make a motion that we, I propose that we deny the application to remove the trail. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Okay, the motion is to deny the application to sell the property where the trail is at. Any other discussion? Okay, we're ready to vote. So this is the vote to deny yes. the application? Uh, my, uh, it's not coming up for some reason. It's not coming up. That's an apple. Brian, do you want to refresh it? I don't know how to refresh it. Mine worked. What's is he that? Still, is he still locked into the... Uh, do you want me to vote for him? <laughs> Any help? <laughs> I, I don't need two votes. I don't want to... No. Can you help him get the vote up? Well, yeah. Can he just vote verbally? No. Shut up. Yeah, you don't have a session. I got it. No, you need a session. I, I have it. There we go. Okay. Um, Mayor, that motion passes three to two. Okay. Thank you, uh, residents. Um, whichever side you're on, feel free to interact with council members going forward. Uh, my office is always open, doors always open. If you want to call me or talk to me, I don't have a vote, but I have an ear. Um, so thank you for participating. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. You so, don't have so, to stay. But so you, one thing you. that I, I think there's an empty feeling to a certain degree about the fact that we've talked about needing to make some some resolutions and, and move forward with some things. I think we need to have a time frame for talking about uh, the fences and, and, and identifying some revenue or, I mean, I think that's important that we don't just leave it there. I agree. And I, I've, I've been talking with Todd. Um, he's, he's has some thoughts on that. I think it'll be part of the, the budget that the staff proposes will include additional money for trails funding for the trails yeah. and what about the fence discussion fence discussion we that would have to be a separate item <coughs> we can i whenever anybody has a solution we can put it on a, as a discussion item on a meeting in the future i'm happy to do that i, I guess i don't understand why we have to discuss the fences again because we spent forever discussing them before what? and it was felt like if it created an alley that you can't have a six foot solid fence i mean we went over that over and over again so if it's a narrow area i don't know how you can do that without creating an alley so i guess we look at it again but we spent a long time we coming did. up with a lot of parameters before we did and, and i guess it's more to have uh, engagement from the residents let them see it give any other ideas if we've missed something i mean we go through and we talk about changing our our city master plan on a five-year basis we talk about lots of different things on a continual basis to make sure that it's it continues to be what we want it to be and i don't see a reason why we couldn't engage the residents and help them see what our concerns were and if there are any other ideas i mean we can have it a discussion item Brian, my, my only concern that. with that is that we're, it sounds like we're going to educate the residents to understand why they can't have a fence that gives them privacy. That, that's education that's not fixing the problem. The other issue that I, that I have in terms of finding fundi funding is that my subdivision met with the mayor, yourself, and with Mayor uh, Mann two years ago this month, and, and there, they were assured that there would be revenue located to fix our problem. We're two years down the road and there hasn't been one, there hasn't been any movement in terms of changing the maintenance issue. So I, I think lip service is important if there's action to support it, 
And so far in the 16 years that, that I've been involved, there's been a lot of promises with no action. And I, and I don't say that to be critical to anyone here, but at some point in time, there has to be a workable solution. I'm not sure what that is, but there has to be a workable solution, and, and we need to find something that's actionable that we can fund adequately so that everyone's satisfied because the majority of the people who just left and who are still here involved in this issue are very disappointed with the decision that was made. There's a small minority that left happy, but the majority of the people are un unhappy. I would, I would say that those eight subdivisions that have benefited from this is action that has happened. I mean, I think that the Open Space Committee has done a lot of good in being able to identify what can and can't work as a city. So I would disagree respectfully that inaction has not happened. We have had action, but we're also a government that goes slow and we haven't done as much as we should. But, but my, my point doesn't, isn't dealing with the people that we've addressed who are now happy. My, my concern is the people who we just turned away and have turned away because we've made promises. We've made promises to all of the people in the, in the city that we're going to improve the trails. And if, and if you ask universally in the city, the biggest complaint, I shouldn't say the biggest, one of the complaints throughout the city is that the trails don't look nice. And that's universally across the city because the only trails that look nice are those adjacent to a park where the park is maintained. The trails that the city just doesn't have funding for are not well maintained. Are you saying they're scruffy? Uh, so I'm so, not saying anything. So that. with I'm, Ed's I'm point, I think I, we I said more than enough. I know, so. but so you know, with with Ed's point, it's not just this one trail that needs to have maintenance. It's all the trails in the Highland. Absolutely. We will start to lose. They will start to deteriorate unless we do something. The asphalt will only stay good for so long. We're starting to have the treat. You know, we have to address it. I'm just saying, yeah. so we, we need to start getting cell coat plans. We need to get, if we have sections that are having potholes. And I know that the, our maintenance department, I'm sure, you know, periodically go out and do things. It, but well, let's, let's be clear. It's not our maintenance department's fault. Correct. It's our fault. And so that's, we need to do something else. We're going to lose all our city trails. This is not just, this is not a Canterbury North issue. This is the city trail issue that we need to address and start. We, you guys did a great job coming up with a road plan. And I know the mayor's talked about, I think we need to come up with a, tra a trail plan where we start to go through and say, this is the sections we're going to start maintaining at what time. And I know, Mayor, you've kind of been advocating that. Yeah. And, and Todd's I, behind. I would like to propose that we move on to the next agenda. Item, I think please. that's a good proposal. And I will call the next item. All right, next item. Item five, public hearing, conditional use permit for park maintenance building. Staff. Can I, can I just make one last comment? No, 30 seconds. In, in the March, <laughs> I, I think we've moved on. Thanks, Scott. In the, in the March, April time frame, we will have, uh, we'll begin talking about the budget. Please engage, look in the budget, see it. We will, we better have money in there allocated for trails or we're going to continue to let people down. And so that's when we'll be able to identify those additional funds that we talked about and whether we put it in there or not, you guys will be able to see whether we've done anything or not. Uh, is it going to fix it all in one day? No, there, there isn't that kind of money, but it will begin the process, which we've got to start somewhere. Well, I think we have two priority trails already. Wilmington and this trail. Correct. Two priorities. Yes. You've made commitments to two subdivisions. <laughs> okay, item five, staff. Okay, thank well, you, Mayor. Uh, go I was just going to, in the interest of putting time. the item on the agenda, uh, on the table, I would like to um, propose that we um, approve a conditional use permit for the park maintenance building located approximately 5600 west and 10400 10, north. I, I would second that. Okay, okay so moved and, session, moved and seconded discussion, staff yeah. start, and then we'll have public hearing and then we'll, then we'll have a vote. Okay. So we had a motion before we even had a public hearing and before we had a presentation. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yes, just, I will just go nobody call it a question because that, that's not going to work. Uh, as the council knows, the uh, city and the council have been working on a site for a park maintenance building since 2014. Um, 
a uh, the uh, farthest we got on a site was the town center site and a conditional use permit uh, was considered and ultimately withdrawn uh, in 2015 uh, by the council. The, for those that don't know, that's the uh, southwest corner of Town Center Parkway and Parkway East. It's kitty corner from the police station right kitty here. Kitty corner from the police station. Half a block that way. It, as we began uh, doing designs for the Mountain Ridge Park Design Council, directed staff to include that as part of that design. Um, one of the things that uh, we need to remember is uh, right now, currently, we are uh, storing our parks, large parks equipment. We did had a field trip uh, a while back in uh, two homes uh, down in the Pheasant Hollow uh, subdivision, and uh, it's anticipated those homes will be removed uh, before next winter. <clears throat> As a result, uh, staff believes we need a shell and a site, uh, the shell completed and site improvements done by November uh, 1st of 2019. We estimate 180 days uh, for construction and 60 days for uh, uh, construction plans, finalizing those and preparing uh, bid documents. As a result, uh, the council really needs to come up with a site, uh, what, regardless of what they do tonight, uh, at the beginning of March at the latest um, <clears throat> for us to meet those deadlines. Uh, as we found out in our other location uh, that we've talked about and the other locations that we've talked about, there has not been broad community support no matter location that's chosen. Uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's on the top 10 of land uses that most people would consider or would want, uh, but it is needed and is needed to uh, serve our parks and maintain our equipment. The uh, next slide shows the uh, park master plan with the building on the left. It is funded separately from the uh, park uh, improvements. Uh, we do have separate funding sources for that. Uh, you'll notice the building site plan. It's a 5,000, next slide please. It's a 5,000 square foot building. It does include uh, space around that will allow semis and deliveries uh, to uh, go around the site and exit back off onto 10400 North. Uh, eliminates one of the concerns that we have uh, as far as site circulation goes. It, is, it would be next to the proposed Mountain Ridge Park, which uh, would have quite a bit of maintenance and lawn maintenance, so it is convenient to that location. And it's centrally located uh, in the city, uh, which helps with uh, ferrying equipment and driving equipment uh, throughout the locations that we need to. The uh, Planning Commission held a public hearing uh, on, oh, excuse me, uh, the next slide shows the uh, floor plan and the elevations. It does have four overhead doors. Uh, primary uh, use of the building uh, will be in the growing season. Uh, you can see the elevations uh, also. Uh, Nathan? Yes, sir. Can I ask a quick question? So these four doors, they face east. They don't face towards the adjacent neighborhood, right? They face east. Okay, so Correct. they face towards the park itself. Yes, sir. Okay. The uh, Planning Commission, uh, next slide. Planning Commission did hold a public hearing on the uh, 29th. Uh, there was a lot of discussion on the park, specifically two residents spoke in opposition of the location of the park maintenance building. We have included in your packet uh, the comment cards and any comments we had that would mention the uh, park maintenance building. They did vote to, they separated the two issues and did vote to recommend approval of this location. Uh, next slide. The council has uh, two options before them. Uh, you can re approve the location as recommended by the planning commission or withdraw the site and specify the location of the facility at a different site. I know there's been <clears throat> some sites, we've done some pre-advertising to, to try and facilitate that, but in reality, we're out of time so in order to meet the schedule we've we need a decision quickly no matter what side it is uh, we need that decision uh, so we can move forward and, and make sure that we don't have equipment uh, out in the elements next winter so I'd like to make a couple comments yes so uh, for the time being uh, you've actually been uh, storing all this park maintenance equipment in my neighborhood in these two houses 
And um, I didn't know that until about a month ago, and this has been going on at least about two years. And my neighbors are quick to complain about a lot of things. They haven't been real crazy about all the dog training for the police department in the one house. But I wasn't even aware that this was a pro or that uh, the city was doing this. So, you know, I guess what my comments is, the doors on this building face the east. They're away from the neighborhood. They face the park. This is a central maintenance building that we desperately need, and it's central to the city. I mean, it's easy access to several parks, and they're going to save a lot in gas money and, and transportation and all this stuff. To me, it makes the best sense. And um, it really is not going to be this terrible, noisy sort of thing because, I mean, I haven't been aware of any noise in our neighborhood, and you've been storing all this stuff in my neighborhood, and I didn't even know it. So I'd like to say that I really support this, and I, and I really would like to move the question. Um, I, th I think it would be fair to, to have input from the other council members. Well, we also yeah. have to have a public hearing first, which is even That's more important than us so, right now. Any more questions for Nathan? Uh, Mayor, just one comment. Uh, going along with what Scott was saying, one thing that might, might be nice on the west side as a buffer to the residents to the west would be put some trees. Right. And I, I'm not sure if that's possible, but that would create a nice buffer. I, I actually was able to talk to the developer today, and he requested the same thing. It wouldn't be an issue. We can put a little bit of landscape buffer there yeah, and keep it inside our, our facility, but put some trees. Yeah, some and, greenery and, ma would, and maintain would, it. Would soften it. <laughs> it would be inside of our, our facility. Well, we have to so. maintain it. Though. Right. And there's a wall there, a six foot wall, too, right? Yeah, yes. Right. Um, so. Public hearing open. Any comments from the public on this issue? Don't be shy. Hi, my name's Hillary Gardner. Um, I live really close to the Mountain Ridge Park, not on the road that the building will be built on, but um, I speak on behalf of my neighbors and my neighborhood. I know it said that there were only two that spoke in opposition of that, but there's a lot <laughs> going on with the comments and everything, and um, I'm not for it. Um, it just can I ask why the um, town center location was withdrawn, or why there aren't other locations that we're looking at? It just seems like we're moving really fast with it, and I feel bad for the people that have this premium lot and they are getting this beautiful view. My neighbors, and they're going to have this building just on the other side of their fence, just right behind them, so. We've been looking for a spot for five years, I think. Five years. And, so and why almost, was the one, the every... town center one withdrawn? Mm -hmm. the same, no, for the same reason. The neighbors didn't like it. So we there, there is no place in Highland that isn't already zoned as residential. And, and so there's no place to put it where there, it won't impact Somebody. Some. Right, and I understand that. They're the looking for a place that it's needed. This is central but, area. So those two homes that you're using right now, didn't you say they're moving? Could you use that space? They're being destroyed. Or the east-west corridor is, is being removed for the east-west corridor. Okay. So, so you're not looking into keeping it there and uh, building the building there? They're, right? They can't, and we don't own the property. Okay. Um, uh, you'll have to come up and <laughs> okay what, what, that's my i just i speak on behalf of my neighbors it's a huge concern that why there you know they're all just like why there yeah and so, we appreciate that yeah. we really do oh, thanks but it has it's it's been going on a long time and we've looked at three other sites as well please several other sites sorry we just need to get your name on record buddy. my name is jennifer Knowles. what about that spot where you guys have the tree cell i don't I don't know what that spot is called where you have that like arbor land right here cell. yeah it's right out here yeah so that's is that the spot you were talking about the town no, center no, oh it was south what, of that right that across spot? the street yeah with that south. right across the street south of that there's a little piece of park and then there's yeah. a bunch of trees next to it it would be the trees and the park there and that that wouldn't work there or? it didn't okay. and then what about um at the old highland city building that's a good suggestion. That's, that is a great suggestion, and that's one that I'm going to talk to in a few minutes. 
Okay. Um, and then um, I, I guess I'm just really surprised that it, like, like she said, that we're moving so fast with it because I was under the impression after the last meeting about the park uh, next to the school that we, that that park plan hadn't been determined yet, that that's still in development, that we still were going to be able to possibly have input on that park. And so it's just surprising that, um, yes. that you'd be putting something there where, when we haven't decided what that's going to look like yet and that possibly that land could have been used for something else. That's, like a, a, that's a really field. good point. Did you pay her, Brian? No. We hadn't talked before. She doesn't even know who I am, except, <laughs> except that she sees my name right there. If it wasn't for that, she wouldn't know. And I might have met him once, but anyway, but he doesn't know me. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, no, it just seems a little premature to just stick it right there. I do live across the street, so I mean, some of my neighbors are complaining. I don't know exactly what it means or what it's going to look like or what the noise or whatever any of that is. But I really had hoped to uh, have some community input about that park. I was looking forward to, to that. Anyway, thank you. And you still will. Sherry Kramer again. Um, I have the same concerns that these ladies do and just wanted to let you guys know that this park has not been fully approved or moved forward and there could be other things that we might want to put in this area that we need. And um, I think Brian Braithwaite at one of the last meetings mentioned that the old city hall might be a good location for this. Just, just to be clear, I didn't pay her either. Okay. No, he, he I did just, not. I just remember what he said, and, and everyone was so worried about all the other stuff on the agenda that it kind of went over uh, everyone's head, and, and they didn't really hear what was happening. But I just want to tell you a little story that happened in American Fork. Um, they actually, the Planning Commission approved a maintenance building by the cemetery, and we actually were in need of cemetery lots at that time, so it was a little confusing as to why they decided to put it there, but they approved it, then the city council approved it, then when they started building it, it was a very large structure, and then all the neighbors came out in force, and they had to reverse uh, gears there, and they decided not to do it. So I just want you to really think about this, because I know you need a maintenance building, but I think there's some other options we could look at, and this is prime parkland that we could use for other things. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Spenz. Um, I live in the Canterbury neighborhood, but I see a sidewalk on the picture, so I wanted to use this to edge in. Um, we really need to have a great sidewalk from Mountain Ridge all the way west to make it a safe corridor. Mm -hmm. And I would recommend doing wider than the traditional sidewalk so there's enough room for bikes and whatever passing each other as they go to and forth. And I want to thank Kurt for doing his dil due diligence. He came by last night and spent as much time as we wanted to talk to him. And I really appreciate his um, earnestness in his um, job. So and I think at one time you mentioned that in some cities they have maybe a four foot sidewalk, but on the other side they put five feet. So there could be a better passing thing. Is that what you mentioned? Yeah, we actually, my wife mentioned, we're moving to American Fork, and our sidewalk there is um, actually like six feet on one side, two feet on the other. So. You're leaving us? No. The hard choice. Is, is that you. a cement sidewalk or asphalt? It's cement, yeah. Hmm. I know the developer that it's the same one that was it, that did the houses right behind Mountain Ridge right there. Uh, they weren't too happy that they had to foot the bill for it, but American Fork was making them do it, so. Thank you. Um, I'm Tyler Sorensen, and I mainly just have a question. I'm with these ladies here. I would love it to be moved somewhere else as well or other options. Um, I'm actually under contract just west in that uh, development. Um, and I just have some questions, I guess. So if it does pass and it does get put there, um, what kind of things are you actually storing in that? in that like asphalt space um question is there going to be like lights on it if it's like manure or you know uh tractors or lawnmowers anything on the exterior is there going to be lights on it maybe at night just questions that way if it does get approved in this location 
So this is our parks maintenance building. So the hours of operation are 7 a.m. till 5, 6 o'clock in, in the evening. So we wouldn't be working in the evenings late. Only in an emergency would we come get a piece of equipment. But what we're going to be storing back there would be lawn care equipment. Yeah, I mean, nothing that would... Uh, we're, we're facing the doors east, so when they start anything up, doing maintenance inside the building, the sound will be focused to the east, into the park, and not into the homes. So we will we'll be good neighbors. Um, I, and I'm just wondering more like security lights or anything on your stuff overnight? No. Okay. Uh, any Good lighting so, on the building. So just from the building itself, and, and that would be on the east side, um, everything behind the building will actually be gated and we'll lock it at night. There won't be access to that back side. There will be one man door that people can come and go on, on that west side. So. Okay. Thank you. There will be some outdoor storage as it relates to material. Right. Uh, manure, things like that, we would store it at a different location. Um, maybe some rock mulch. Uh, Josh, maybe you can jump in. Anything else that you can think that we would store back there? Like engineering wood chips for the playgrounds? Yeah. Basically, like anything snow, you would like find in a park. Okay. Um, our snow removal is up at our main shop, up at the mouth of the canyon. We'll stay there. We'll stay there. And yes. this really won't be used in the wintertime much. I mean, this is really parks maintenance, so they, you'll yeah. see the majority of it while the parks are growing, the okay. grass is growing. Not not 100%, but... Right. Josh, Josh and his group will be doing maintenance inside, but you won't see a lot of activity around the building in the winter. Okay. And I think, you know, Todd, get, correct me if something's wrong, but if there are outside lighting, there's going to be... They have to, as a city, we're going to have to adhere to the same requirements we give to others where they have to have certain dimming before... It can, you know, you do a dimming thing as it spreads out from the property that can't be so light from that property. I think that was one of your questions yeah, was about I mean, the lights. Yeah, nice. there, there shouldn't be a lot of light pollution making it over the fence. In fact, we've been asked by the developer to put some trees up along that side. Um, but anything as far as lighting would be shielded facing down, similar to what Councilman Osler is talking about. Okay. So you didn't ask me if you could leave our neighborhood. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe. I don't think I can give you permission. <laughs> Your wife is going to have to give you that, not me. I, I do want to address real quick, if I can, Council Mayor. Um, so I've been the city engineer for two years now, hired inside, but I was acting as a consultant for several years before helping the city out. Over four years ago, I did, I want to say it was eight different locations in the city. So we did site plans on eight different locations. So it has been well vetted to look at all of the sites and what the issues are. And this site is, is, is ideal for us as staff because we are as close as we can be to the biggest park in the city and where our staff will spend a lot of their time. And as you all know, we're understaffed, we're underfunded. We're looking for the best place that we can be to provide the level of service that we can. And so we're happy to go other locations. This is the site that makes the most sense, but at the end of the day, we'll do whatever is best for the community. Any other comments? Okay, final thing at the gavel. Public session hearing closed. Brian. Okay, right for a minute though. Um, I have a question for Tim Merrill. If I move the question, don't we have to vote on whether there's continued discussion or not as a council? Yes. So we've had a motion and a second, and I moved the question. So I think if we continue on with discussion, and I don't want to be rude with anyone, but Too late. If, if, do that. if we continue the discussion, don't we have to vote on the question I moved it? Under the modified rules of... So we need to hold a vote now before we continue. Well, so the, so the, the mayor has the ability... These are Robert's rules of order, and the issue would be if you don't have any discussion on it, then how can you really make a move on a motion? You have to give some discussion and except council, we've, we haven't had any we've all had these discussions though before brian i mean we've went through this doug before. are you saying yeah. the, the move to question has to be seconded yeah. 
Correct. So I move the question, and if there isn't a second, then it I'll, fails. I'll second that. So, but the question I think has to also legality, Tim. The the motion was made before we had any public hearing. I mean, I think some timing we have to be careful with here. Is there, Tim? Is there concerns with that with the timing when the motion happened? I just want to ask, why are we stopping the debate and a discussion? I mean, if this is if we're supposed to be transparent, why not have some discussion on this? Because we've discussed this um, in the council for like five years, and then we can talk about it for another half hour, 45 minutes, and I appreciate your discussion because we've had the discussion about having it in this other location. So I'm not sure why we just need to keep discussing the same so thing. So Scott, this is like five, five years. I haven't been on the council to hear the discussions. I'm sorry. I was, but no, at the planning commission, this never came up on it. So, so I mean, it's going, wow. as we talk about discussion, I appreciate the other four council members, but I've never had this discussion to understand what the other things, and, and there's some questions I have even for Tim. This is in a park zone, which is our, we, we have a bond on. Can we put a maintenance building? I understand it might be for parks and things. Can that go on this property or does it have to be only for parks? It can go on this property, according to my understanding of yeah. the, of the, um, the use of it. Um, so it's an appropriate use, and uh, in terms of moving the question, um, it's it's not debatable. It does require a second, and it's been seconded. So we just need to vote on that question. Let's let's just do a voice vote. Um, we don't unless you. So what was the motion that we're motion gonna... is to vote on whether or not to put the building there or not without any further discussion which I, I would favor some discussion personally. Uh, so let's just, uh, Brian. So I vote no because I believe we ought to have some discussion for transparency. Okay. Yes. 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 No. Okay. <laughs> Them's the rules, sorry, don't make them up. Um, all right, and so the motion is what? Tim made the motion and had seconded it to approve this side. But Tim made the motion. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, Tim made the motion. Okay. So the motion is to approve the, the current location. I find it interesting that we don't even know what the motion is. Yeah. Two thirds. Okay, so perfect. All right, doesn't pass then. Oh, didn't pick that one well, up. Well, we gotta make sure, that would come from our attorney, I understand. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's true that the two thirds to cut off debate is, is required, but the council's never adopted really technical rules. So well, if, if, then if, the mayor, if, we, if we need to, so then we need to probably. If that's the case, then the mayor doesn't have so to I accept have the other piece either. <laughs> So I, I, th I think it's a fair thing. Um, if we're gonna go by letter of the law, then good point, thank you. Let's, um, hear, let's hear Brian's comments. Yes, so Brian, go. We're, uh, the, the motion failed. You got 60%, not 66. So the reason for the discussion is this. From a park standpoint, we have just sold another piece of parkland to help fund this particular park. This, we don't have a whole lot of parkland. I believe putting that there's a higher use, a higher value use of this land than putting that building there. And I would propose that we put it behind the community center. We've talked about it. There are problems no matter where we put it, but we're never going to put a park behind the community center. What's the use or what's the value? What are we gonna use that for? If we don't put this on this piece of property, we could reconfigure this park and add probably one more field based upon um, shifting some things around to where we could actually have three fields on this parkland. That to me has a much higher value to us as a city and to the residents because of where it's physically located and because of the, the lack of other resources that we have for parks at this point in time, I believe that's a better value or better use of the land there than if we moved it over behind the city building. So Todd, is there sufficient space there 
is there sufficient space at the dam? I did three different concepts for that area. I'm pulling them up right now. I thought there was a problem with the traffic because it's so close to that corner. Now that's a major intersection. It's definitely not ideal. There, there were a couple issues with that area. Um, we, we have to configure the, the site a little bit differently, which is not an issue. But the main, the main issue was being close to the intersection. Um, larger trucks would have to back back into 10400 north. Um, the other issue was is we, we couldn't get access to uh, SR-74, which we, we looked at doing, but it's too close to the intersection as well to try to pull out that way. Um, so the other issue is just utility. Studio, Go ahead. Except the dance studio got it, so. Dance studio allowed an out right next and in out right next to the intersection of 50 the right in right out right in right well out. And that's, I, that's every bit as close as what this one so is. i approached you dot permits and they told me no so if if we push the issue possibly um the other issue was just trying to coordinate with the arts council parking uh events they use that area for overflow parking now and so we would just look to make sure that we're providing enough parking that they could utilize that in the evenings. But they do have some day activities down there where we would be having that conflict with parking. So let me kind of share with you what I, I went. Mr. Binks is the house owner directly to the west of that property there. I went and spoke with him this afternoon. And one of the questions is, is he has about a 75 foot area by the side of his house that just envisioning one of the concerns, I, I'm the council person over the Arts Council, so I'm going, I've got to defend those, but one of the thoughts is when I talked with Mr. Binks is to say, could we maybe use 35 feet or 40 feet of that fence area as an easement and we could take an access road for our parks department only to go back in there. We don't touch the community center parking lot. We go along, you know, they're about 35 feet going in and then his big issue, there's two trees there. He wants to make sure that, and he'd like to keep the back of the property. So then we would come and curve back into the back of that property. That way we would not be touching the community center parking lot. There's some safety issues. I think if we're having trucks coming in and out of there during the day, because there are kids, if it be for the arts council or other community events where they'd be in that parking lot. So this, we could s separate that one access drive only for the parks department. And, and, and that, when I asked him, he's amenable to discussion. We didn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, he's amenable for us to you know, talk with him about that as an option. So if you, if you can see the, th the plan, this is one of the concept plans that I did several years ago, which would show an extension of the current parking lot. They still would access out onto 10400 North and we would have the, um, the uh, storage area back to the to the east, if that makes sense. The biggest issue is just trying to combine with the parks, or excuse me, the arts council and all of the activities they have on that site. Would this have a bathroom in its own office in the building, or would you be trying to come to the community center? Originally, we were told five years ago that we would need to combine them, but it just. In, in talking to them and, and, and discussing the uses that they have, it would make sense for us to have a restroom in the building itself and not combine. This is the exact same size building as we're proposing at the, uh, the park, a 50 by 100. But, but you got it pulled forward, so really, when they have a play, they do go in that dirt parking lot and park, and so really, we're, we're, that dirt parking lot would not be available. I mean, I was hoping maybe it could be further back and they could use the front half to park in. Right, and, and we're providing a little bit more parking there that they could utilize, but just it's not much. We can look at this site if this is what the council would like. I'll tell you the only reason. We've gotten a lot of flack back on Mountain Ridge, you know, the Mountain Ridge Park. If we could get an extra field, if we take this acre, instead of having this, we can somehow, you know, we don't know exactly what we're doing with Mountain Ridge. We don't know if we're getting 27 pickleball courts or what's happening with it. If we can get a third field in, it just seems unwise for us to look at that as an option to be able to get a third field. I'm just, it seems like that'd be a good, you know, conversation to have with residents. Hey, we've, we've tried to modify things to get this park to get an extra field. Now, if we can't get an extra field and we're set in with having 27 pickleball courts and it's going to fit, 
And I, I do get nervous about being late in the game too, Todd. I, I apologize kind of getting us in late in the game. So what you can see up there, Kurt, is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I did ten concept plans and we got flack from residents on every single one. We're up against a wall. We have nowhere to put equipment. We need a site tonight to start moving forward. So I am fine. Josh is fine with the city, the, the city center location, but we need a decision tonight. We would prefer the park because it's easier for staff. But I understand residents, if I lived there, I'd have a concern too. I would. But when we pr proposed the city, city center, we had several residents around there that had concerns. They came in. They, uh, mayor Adamson was one of them, former mayor. So we have concerns with every single site. It just, we will be the best neighbors that we can. Keep in mind this building is similar height as a home. We have the same height restrictions. So it would be like having a back door home next to you. It's actually lower than what the... What the height restriction is, correct. 25 feet. Yeah. Compared to 35. 35. So we're 10 feet lower than what we could be as a home. Uh, Todd, is it possible to put a pitched roof on this maintenance building so that it looks more like a residence? We, we, can, we can do things with the aesthetics. The problem is, is it's money. And we are up against the wall with money as well, as everybody knows from the conversations tonight. This is the bare minimum to get by. In fact, we are not going to build the interior offices. We're getting a shell. That's all we're getting so we can get equipment inside. Yeah. So I'm not convinced yet that this is the safest place to put that. I mean, we've discussed this before because the exit with this equipment right on that intersection almost. And that's why we talked about moving the park. And I'd like to have another field, but I'm not sure the property for this maintenance is big enough for another field, is it, Nathan? Could you put another field in there? <clears throat> you, uh, you could if you moved two of the courts up and or spread them out across. If you, um, like in the bottom of the park there, if you put the All Abilities Park and then open this up, this right now can do a field this way and this way and this way and this yeah, way. If you take that out, then you can do a field this way, this way, and that way. So you'd actually have So it was, it was a concept known as the spaceship design, if, if you remember that one. But yeah, it had all the field, all the courts along 10400, and you could get three fields on the bottom. Can, can I just uh, ask Todd a question? Um, could we, it, at the next council meeting, you, you've got the, this land queued up for a, be on the, the planning commission, correct? <clears throat> yes, I do, because so we're we, that short on time. We, we could, so if we continued this till the next council meeting, we could have pick option A or pick option B as a legitimate vote, right? And we'd have more information about both. Um, How much more information are we gonna have? We'd have, we'd have more information about the, not about the park, but about the, the, um, the community center building did, and, and did what you, the possibilities would be. Did you want me to move it and do something different with it? Is that what you're looking for? I, I'm just... He just showed us what's the possibility. I, so the agenda item tonight is for this location, so we need to focus discussion on this. I'm just saying that if, if this isn't the site, we need to pick one. Right. We... we but we can't get into. We can't, we can't pick one we're tonight. Not, yes. We, we can say no to this, but we can't say yes to anything else. Right. So, right. so my recommendation would be to continue it to our next meeting when we can have both options and then vote whichever way the council feels. Right now we can just vote yes or no on one option. Um, so let me ask a question to Tim. So it seems like Councilman Irvin, Irvin I'm sorry, it's getting late. Yeah, made a motion to right. put the building there and Councilman Dennis seconded it. Correct. Don't we have to do something with that motion? Yeah, it can be amended. You can, you can amend it, you can make another uh, motion, then you work backwards. So at, at this point you could, if everyone's done debating, you could vote on that motion or someone could amend it. The mayor suggested another alternative. Uh, Mayor, just a quick comment. Uh, when we talked about this property, the community center and the mountain ridge, we talked about them together. 
And my recollection is the major deterrent to the community center was a safety issue. Again, as Scott already mentioned, you have large delivery trucks coming right out on a, on a major intersection with a, with a light. You also have school traffic there. You have community center activities. So to me, even though it may be a nice location, there, there are too many potential safety issues that would that would favor the Mountain Ridge location over the community center. Those are, those well, let's, are fair let's, comments. Let's, let's be fair. This is a half a block further the other direction. Most or at least half of the people coming to the junior high are coming from the other direction. So everything that you've just described is also an issue coming the other direction from traffic. The exception is the intersection and I don't believe that they're going to be taking and Josh, you can correct me, but I don't think you're going to be taking a delivery every hour during the day. You're going to take deliveries at certain times during the day. Those can be coordinated to at least some degree, be able to do it. I'm not saying this is perfect. There's no question that there's a problem. There's, there's no a, perfect answer. Yeah, exactly. And I'm looking at it, what is the best use of the land? And I'm not professing that this is not going to have its issues. I'm just saying it is not as extreme of a difference as what has been discussed before. This is an option. It's best use of land. The and community center already has parking issues. And so this is, in my view, it would make it worse. Yeah. So, you know, I, that's why I prefer the other, the other one. Fair statement. I So it's been moved and seconded. Is there an amendment or further discussion or are we ready to vote? Ready to vote. Okay. No further discussion. Okay. We're voting. Is it coming up? I haven't seen it come up yet, Eric. Yeah. All right, you have to stay an extra hour after teach you to do that. Mayor, that motion passes three to two. Okay. All right, next item. Um, Justice Center security action item. I'm disappointed you didn't take my suggestion, Brian. Put a door room in out front. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, I guess we could we could talk about doing that. There are better <laughs> there are better breeds than Dobermans to do that with. But um, I, I know it's getting late. I'll be as brief as possible. Uh, you have the information in front of you. Um, what we're asking for is to update the security in the front of the Justice Center, which would include some ballistic glass and ballistic paneling that would cover both the police and the court sides. What has facilitated this? Um, when we took possession of the building some nine years ago, uh, there were some uh, areas in which we needed to cut some, uh, some costs, and this was part of the area, was the, the security of the front of the building. What we have in there currently is uh, just some wood paneling and normal glass and doors. What we're asking to do is to upgrade that to ballistic panels and ballistic glass uh, to prevent any type of uh, attack that may come in from the front of the building. Um, in recent months, and as early and as recent as this afternoon, we had uh, people entering the building, or a gentleman came in today that uh, is upset with the court and actually the judge and, uh, about over some issues and has threatened uh, staff, my staff as well as court staff. Uh, Mr. Merrill had a conversation with him today that was pleasant from my understanding. and. Um, Anyway, this is continuing to be, this is starting to become a, uh, a regular occurrence. And so in order to um, make safe the front end of that building and, and have the employees, the ladies that sit at the front counter feel safe, and the, uh, we're asking to, to make these upgrades. Now, if you look down through your packet, there's a cost estimate that the cost estimate is uh, just short of $100,000. Um, if you keep reading down through there, there was an estimate, we were estimating another $50,000 on top of that to include labor. Um, 
but the cost estimate that you see in front of you, I called and talked to the architect today, includes labor and materials, so there wouldn't be that additional cost of $50,000 that, uh, that's in your packet. Just wanted to be mindful of that. Of that. There are some renderings through your packet. Uh, if you want to take a look at those, we can discuss them. It shows you the ballistic paneling and the ballistic glass that would be put in. Uh, this would be a construction cost, and, and you have the numbers in front of you. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. So Chief, Chief Williams, could you just help us on your budget where this will be coming out to be able to fund the 100000 So, Nathan, I'll turn to you on that one. Since we are the landlord, it would come from our budget, not the police budget, and it would have to come from previous year earnings. But we could raise the rent. Yeah, we could do that. <laughs> but, Charge ourselves. So I don't understand why it doesn't come out of the Lone Peak Safety District. Uh, the agreement between the Lone Peak Safety District and the various cities on the facilities, of, if there's any improvements, uh, less than $500, that comes out of their budget. If there's improvements above $500, it comes out of the respective city's improvements, city's budgets, excuse me. Part, part of the reason why we went through this, we had a big, a big discussion about who pays for what and it had to do with more with the fire station and things that we were talking about there and who ends up owning it and, and paying for it and stuff like that. And that's really what the bottom line is, is we are the owners of the building and we are let, renting it to the safety district. So should the district go away, we still own the building. And that's why we would pay for it, but we could raise the rent. I mean, that is... What's our lease agreement over there? Do we have it on it just a month to month? Or, I mean, when, how soon could we, is it a five year? We'd have to wait five years. I mean, I know you're joking, It's not but that specific. We don't have a specific lease agreement. Is there actually a rent payment from the district? Yes, there is. We pay, Alpine pays. So we could eliminate rent and we could just use that money that's in our budget to pay for it. I, I'll throw uh, that out there. Yeah, not that, that cut that's and dry. That's probably a discussion for another time, but. It's yeah. not that cut yeah. and dry. <laughs> Yeah, that would be nice, but. So we don't have any police facilities in Alpine. Correct. So they're That's never. Correct. Used to be there. Other than paying this. rent, they're not on the hook to correct. any improvements in the justice building. That's correct. As long as we have our, our uh, interlocal agreement, they are pretty much on the hook. In fact, we're for what we're paying for the upgrade here. Yeah, they're on hook Our for the rent the portion, but they're not on their, their portion of rent or their portion that they pay into it. But unless you raise the rent, it doesn't change. Correct. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we could raise the rent. I, I, Sorry, I, I, this is I, a business person. I, is, do we have a, Do we have a lease agreement? Are we double net, triple net? I mean, is the tenant supposed to be? We do not have improvements a lease agreement or, like that. Uh, We've okay. just agreed to a payment. I'm all in that favor of the improvements. I think that's critical, but it does seem odd that we're picking up 100% of the cost when at well, least a portion of the people coming in are coming in from Alpine. I don't, I, I'm suggesting that we, we recoup some of that cost through increasing our rent payment. At least the rent payment to Alpine. Yeah, but they're right. the only ones to use it. <laughs> it won't, it, it won't do us any good to charge us more rent. Right. <laughs> but that, but we we have to, we cover two thirds of the cost anyway. They're only a third. They're half the size of what we are. I, so but, uh, two, a third's better than nothing. <laughs> exactly. We raise the rent, and then we get we that, pay one yeah. two thirds, and yeah. so we'd pay for it twice because we'd raise the rent, and it would come out of our budget. Our allocation amount. We get the money back. So yeah, if rent goes away, we actually do why, decrease. But why that's couldn't we story. approach Alpine and ask them? I'm, I was going to mention that I'm just, happy to, to approach. just approach them and say, why don't you cover a third of this, and then the rent won't go up? <laughs> I mean, that seems pretty practical. But or if you yeah. raise the oh, rent we'll in both cities, right just pay for it out of the rent increase. I, you know, I, it just seems like Alpine maybe needs to share in the costs here. Well, I, well, I well we're going to have. Sure an awesome opportunity coming up to discuss the interlocal with Alpine and how that works. So, so I guess the question is, we want to wait to talk with Alpine. It seems like we have some security issues right now at our Highland Justice Center. Do we want to move forward with, uh, I guess I'll make a motion. I uh, propose that we approve the security upgrades for the Highland Justice City Center lo lo lobby uh, to not to exceed $98,979. Second. Can I add an amendment? Sure, you can try. 
<laughs> thank, thank you. Can I have a second? <laughs> I'll second it. <laughs> oh, I love that Wait, this I is coming that. back to um, that last let, piece. Let me make uh, the amendment that I would add is that we reach out to Alpine and ask them to cover a third of the cost, if, assuming that's the split, two thirds a third, so that yeah, we I'll, don't have to increase the rent. I just sent a message to their city administrator. I'll second we'll that conversation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The, an amendment has been made to the motion that's been seconded. So we'll vote on the amendment and first, right? We'll vote on the amendment first. Um, we'll just do a voice vote if you're can okay. You, can you clarify what the amendment was? We're just supposed to talk to him? What, what's we're, we're just we're approving it, but stipulating that the staff talk, reach out to Alpine. So we're, we're asking them to pay a, a third. third or whatever their whatever their share is. Yeah, whatever some, their share or is. Or some and, portion, but you're yeah. not saying if they don't, then this is not approved. No, I didn't say that. Okay, I, I, just, I said I we're going to reach out, clarity. reach out to so Alpine to ask them to pay whatever their percentage is in lieu of a rent increase. Okay, I think that's a good I'm, idea. I'm assuming a third because we're twice I, the I size of them. The that's the only reason why. Yeah, it's close. Just over 34 percent, so we're close. <laughs> yeah, that's a third. 34. Okay. So all in favor of the amended of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? No, that's unanimous. Now we're voting on the amended motion. Thanks, Brian. No, no, you just voted on the amended motion. Now you're going to vote on the motion. Right. We're going to okay. vote on the motion which has been amended. Yes. Okay. Do you want to? Can we do that with the voting? Yeah, it's, it's up to right. Okay. Mayor, that motion passes five to zero. Okay. That takes care of the action items on the meeting. There was a, one discussion item. Um, I assume that's Ed. Is that your uh, discussion I think Gary item? has a report. Gary has a presentation. Okay. okay. I'd be happy to jump in. Okay, and this is just information, right? Right. Correct. You want to go to the first slide? We had a... Uh, I guess a discussion a couple of weeks ago on when the library was here when we talked about how we allocate cost to the library. And I think it was back in May of 2015, we discussed about charging the library rent right and other specific items. Yeah. So I just want to talk a little bit here about cost allocation principles because we allocate costs to the enterprise funds and we allocate costs to the library funds. And OMB Circular A122 kind of covers what you need to know as far as cost allocation in that um, there's different methodologies available for allocating costs, but the methodology used should result in an equitable distribution of costs. So equitable doesn't necessarily mean equal, but it means fair and you, know, you can just support it. And considerations in determining an appropriate base for allocating costs include relative benefits received, materiality of the cost, and the amount of time and cost to perform the allocation. So I don't want to spend 40 hours of my time allocating costs. I got other things to do, but um, that's kind of like what the first slide is about. Now the current methodology, if we go to the next slide, that was kind of agreed on, I guess almost four and a half years ago, was since the library's in this building, we can identify that they pay for the part of the phone, part of the IT support, part of the janitorial work, part of the utilities. We even included a, a theoretical rent charge, which was $10.32, is which what Alpine pays for the court building per square foot and then we allocate out the property and liability insurance charge also. So those are the expense items that's currently being used to allocate to the library. And so it gets allocated this way. So you got a budgeted item in the admin phone expense and the library's got three out of 19 phones so they get 319 to the phone budget. I allocated out the IT expense by FTEs. Uh, I'm not gonna get into we, if we could change that or not, but. I figured the more the number of people would call in for IT support, so that's the percent of full-time equivalent employees. Building maintenance right now is done on the percent of total square feet at the city hall uh, that the library takes up. So there's 18,800 square feet in this building, about 4,000 is the library, so they get like 23% or whatever that amount of the um, charge that we get for charge for janitorial service. And that's the same percentage we use when we get the utility bills for this uh, building and then insurance is done by total pro 
property insured square feet uh, that the library represents of total insured square feet for our buildings. And then since it's in a separate fund, you'd want to true it up at the end of the year. So if the budget was 70,000 bucks, if we only spent $50,000 in those accounts, then the library would get a positive 20,000 change. If we spent $20,000 more, they'd get to share in their, their portion of the extra $20,000 in expenses. So Ed and I met, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is kind of the way I allocate it right now to open space and the enterprise funds. So the first step is I take all the total non-payroll benefits expenses. So subtract out salaries, benefits, part-time wages, and you add up all those, those costs from the council, admin, finance, audit, treasurer, planning attorney, and recorder, those listed there. I say that all those uh, departments benefit the variety of funds in the city. Now then I multiply that amount by 40%, and that's my best guesstimate that the amount of those non-payroll expenses benefit the other funds. And that amount then equals the amount of overhead to be allocated to the various funds. So the second step, Ed and I would looked at this, you add up all the expenses for the library, and this includes payroll and benefits and capital expenditures, library, cemetery, all those funds there. You add up what their total expenses are. And then in the third step, you take the percentage of each one of those is to the total expense. And then in the step four, you multiply that percent. That's to be allocated out, and that's how you get a true up to actuals also at the end of the year. So as an example, if I had total non-payroll benefits expense with the council, the finance, the treasurer, et cetera, for $500,000, and I multiply that by 40%, I'm gonna allocate $200,000 in costs out to those seven funds. If the total of all the budget expenses for the stated funds for library, open space, cemetery, and the four enterprise funds is a million bucks, and the library expense is $100,000, they got 10% of the expenses Therefore, 10% times the $200,000 of allocated cost, they get a $20,000 allocation of overhead. That's my estimate of what uh, my time, the treasurer's time, other people's time benefits those funds. So if we go to the last slide, the question now is, uh, do we like the specific method that we're using right now? Uh, do we want to true up or not? And if we're thinking about changing the method, are we going to start now or are we going to wait till the next fiscal year? So that's just some things to think about in this communication item. And let me know as I proceed with, so we've already started the budget for next year. That process has been started. I don't know if Ed wants to make any comments. Yeah, Mayor, just real quickly, one of, the, one of the concerns that was expressed, I think uniformly by the council was that we ought to be consistent in our allocation methodology. And the, the, the second method that, that Gary's using would, would bring the library as well as the cemetery, I think those are the two changes in line with the rest of the funds in terms of how the indirect costs are being allocated. So it's it, in, 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 in compliance with the uh, regulation that you were quoted, we would be consistent across the entire city for all the funds, special revenue funds and enterprise funds in terms of allocating indirect costs. So I, I personally favor that because it's it's uniform, it's actually fairly easy to process for Gary, so he doesn't have to do a lot of extra cost accounting, which we're really not set up to do cost accounting within the city. And so I, I, th I think it's a, a, a nice way to, to put this issue to rest in a, in, a, in a way that will still allocate indirect costs, but not require an extra effort on Gary's part. And, and we'll make it more auditable because we're uniform across all the funds within the I city. would agree. I lo love the idea and maybe every year or two we go come back and take a look and make sure that it's still the right proportions but i let's make it the same treat everybody the right. same i but agree 100 percent. so this is called the true up well what you since the we never trued up previously because the library charges and the and the revenue were all in this general fund but now that they're in a separate fund normally you would i would personally true up so if, if i allocated for example $77,000 is what was allocated to the library and costs for all these for the original budget. Now, if you take out the $44,000 that you're thinking about changing the rent charge, that's basically $32,000 in costs they get. Now, if the costs end up being more than $32,000 in those budget line items, I'm asking, wouldn't you want to true them up? So if the phone expense now is $10,000 instead of five, 
the library is going to get a portion of that five thousand dollar extra expense. So I'm going to take the actuals at the end of the year and say, did it come up to to thirty two thousand bucks? No, it was forty thousand dollars. So the library may not know their budget if it goes over that amount, and they may be better off it goes if it goes under that amount. I'm going to guess, though, on the whole, any chance of going under would be less than it going higher. Uh, Gary, I, I think what if I'm hearing the council correct. I think the preference is to go to the standard allocation method they're using for the enterprise funds so that there would still be a need for a true up. The only problem is is you put the cart before the horse or vice versa because you usually don't have the final cost allocations until into the next fiscal year. Yeah. And, and so you get into a little bit of a timing problem in terms of how to allocate that. I mean, we can still do a true up. But it, it's going to be after the fact, after we've already essentially closed the books. I, I'm not sure the best method to do that, but you could true it up possibly earlier in the year, it, earlier in the fiscal year, so that you don't have that issue at the end of the year. But typically, if spreading that, that, that true up across all the enterprise funds, the special revenue funds, it's not going to have a, a significant impact on that. It, it Let's could. Hope not. I it would could. probably try to true it up in the middle of June, what based on 11 months worth of data, and exactly. then look at the last month and say, is it significant to do another true up or not? Yeah, and, and that's probably de minimis in terms of that indirect cost allocation. Although, you could you could carry that over and add it to the indirect allocation in the next fiscal year. Right. In other words, if you were under 20,000, add that to the allocation expense for the next year so that they were paying for that in the next fiscal year. Correct. So I, I, I think truing it up is fine, but again, the, the, the standard allocation method that we're all using, already using for the other funds would be, uh, I think, the best way to proceed. One other comment, uh, given the fact that we're eight months into the current budget cycle, it would be nice to implement this change July 1 uh, so that we don't have to try to retroactively apply this. Uh, again, we're not, we're not making decisions today. I'm just saying that's my preference. Uh, it makes us, makes it so that Gary knows where we're at, so the library knows where they're at, uh, so that the reimbursements would continue from the general fund through the end of June, and then the library would start picking up this indirect charge out of their budget. Again, that's just a discussion item. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, there's, there isn't a perfect allocation. Let's just take it to the end of the fiscal year for simplicity. So we leave the, in place the cross charges that are currently for this fiscal year. Uh, the cross and then, charges and the, the reimbursement from the general fund. But, but all budgets coming forward show the new allocation. Yeah, we would pick right. up the indirect charge as part of the library budget. Okay. Do you see a problem with that from a staff standpoint? I don't see a problem. I think, um, no, Donna has prepared multiple budgets based on multiple amounts of revenue, so we can make whatever we need to work. Um, yeah, so we can okay. make that work. I, and, and I think this is a compromise that, that's trying to consider Donna's efforts, because this way she doesn't have to change anything until June, or July, excuse me. Or for the next budget. So She'll have to pick which budget she budget. wants. Yeah, the next budget cycle. So you're assuming, Ed, that um, then the, well, I guess the question then is rents, we talked about in two or a month ago, rent was eliminated, and then the general fund would subsidize however much the, the council felt comfortable subsidizing. Well, I, I think based on what I was saying is nothing would be changed. There would still be a rent charge, but there would be a reimbursement from the general fund. I think it was. 7, I thought we agreed 000. to get rid of the rent. I thought that was the consensus of the well, council when we spoke. About yeah, it. the consensus is to eliminate the rent. I, mean, we I guess that's just talking about when you do it, if with the next budget, or do you do it retroactive? I mean, we can leave the rent in or out. It would change the amount of the transfer from the general fund if you take it out. I, I'm indifferent. If you leave it in, it's the amount of the budget adjustment I proposed last time just, that got put on hold. Just treat it as if we never had the discussion this year, and next year it's the whole new thing. Yeah. Got it. That, and that's exactly what I was saying. So as of June, July 1st of 2018, whatever the plan was then, that's what it's going to run through June 30th of 2019. Right. Exactly. 
Okay. Exact same way. Rent, allocation, everything. Exactly the same way. And the general fund subsidizing all cross Correct. charges. Yes. Right. And it just okay. comes in and out because you pay it back to the general fund, right? Right. Yeah, it nets to zero. And it's probably better for the library by doing this where they're not going to have to come up with funds, but there's been lots of discussion of lots of stuff like lack of payment before into the fund because of the revenue coming from automobiles and stuff like that. Let's just clear, let it run until it's done this year and then start, start anew. Okay. Sounds great. Any other discussion? I would entertain. I'll second it. Moved and seconded in favor. So moved. Aye. 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 Done.